Flux Radio Theater, a classic radio anthology series, was broadcast on the NBC Blue Network from 1934 to 1935 which was the National Broadcasting Company, later predecessor of American Broadcasting Company in 1943 to 1945, Columbia Broadcasting System 1935 to 1954, and NBC Radio 1954 to 1955. Initially, the series adapted Broadway plays during its first two seasons before it began adapting films. These hour-long radio programs were performed live before studio audiences. The series became the most popular dramatic anthology series on radio, broadcast for more than 20 years and continued on television as the Lux Video Theater through most of the 1950s. The primary sponsor of the show was Unilever through its Lux Soap brand. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Dick Powell, Claire Trevor, June Dupre, and Mike Mazurki in Murder, My Sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Irving Pitchell. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In answer to the proverb that a leopard cannot change its spots, we bring you tonight a gentleman who turns his back on many years of light and frothy roles by which he climbed to stardom and takes the part of a ruthless, hard-as-nails detective in a drama as relentless as the crimes that it unfolds. He's Dick Powell, hailed so enthusiastically as Philip Marlowe in RKO's sensational success, Murder, My Sweet. Co-starred with him in her screen role as the fatal and mysterious Helen is Claire Trevor. Also, June Dupre, whose natural loveliness would lead us to expect a touch of romance in our play. And towering above our microphones is Mike Mazurki, as the quietly alarming Moose Malloy. Four characters of widely different natures and conflicting motives, involved in one of the screen's most baffling and complex mysteries, a story that in its published form was one of the best-selling thrillers of our time. Most of the action of Murder, My Sweet takes place right here in Hollywood, not too far from our stage. If you saw the picture, you've seen many Hollywood sights from Malibu Beach to Sunset Towers, from the skyline of Los Angeles to the canyons of our hills, landmarks as native to Hollywood as the radio and motion picture studios from which these dramas come. In fact, the name Lux on the outside of our theater is, I venture to say, as familiar a landmark in this capital of entertainment as Lux Soap itself is familiar in the dressing rooms of screen scar stars. A standard of complexion care from coast to coast, Lux Toilet Soap is a friendly link between your home and Hollywood. And now, we take you to the downtown section of our city on the first act of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. When you got something to say, start at the beginning. Okay. It's 7 o'clock at night, and I'm in a 2 by 4 coupe I call my office. I sit at my desk and look at the sign on the door. Philip Marlowe, it says. Philip Marlowe, private investigator. Hmm. That's a nice title for somebody you go to see when you don't want to see the law. I was tired out. I'd been out peeking under old Sunday sections for a barber named Dominic, whose wife wanted him back. I forget why. Anyway, I didn't find him, and the only reason I took the job was because my bank account was trying to crawl under a duck. I just found out all over again how big Los Angeles is. My brain felt like a plumber's handkerchief. I took out my little black book and decided to go grouse hunting. Nothing like soft shoulders to improve my morale. I'm dialing a number when the door opens and he walks in. The mountain that walks like a man. The biggest mug I ever saw outside of a side show. You, Marlowe? Yeah? I seen your name downstairs. They had the names that was in the building. You're a private eye, huh? That's right. I'd like you to look for somebody. I'm closed up, pal. I looked for her where she worked, but I've been out of touch. Come around tomorrow, we'll talk about it. I think maybe we should do it now. Let go of me, you big ape. I don't mean to do nothing. Here, I give you some dough. You come with me. Okay. Okay, I come with you. It ain't far. A cafe on Central Avenue. 
We can pick up a cab. The place was called Florian's. It looked like trouble, but that didn't bother me. The two twenties the big lug had dropped felt nice and snug against my appendix. I tried to figure out who he was looking for. I tried to picture him in love with somebody, but it didn't work. They changed this place a lot. There used to be a stage and some boots. Lattice work and pink flowers. She was cute like a bug's ear. A redhead. Eight years since I seen her. Six years she didn't write. But she'll have a reason. Yeah, yeah, she'll have a reason. What did you do here, singer? Yeah. Let's you and me nibble a couple. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Whiskey. Hey, boss, he's here again. He said you're here again. Yeah. I come in before. I try to find her. Now, look, big boy, I told you once I'm sorry about your girl, but she ain't here. Her name is Velma. You never heard of Velma, Mr. Florian? She used to work here. You better drink up, Joe. That lady at the end of the bar, maybe she knows. I'll have to request you don't bother the customers, see? Lady, you remember a girl used to work here? Her name was Velma. You talking to me? I said leave the customers alone. So far, you rate me polite, huh? I don't bother you none. Swallow your drink and get out of here. Get out of my way. Come on, pal. Eight years is a lot of gin. They don't know anything about Velma here. Some guys has the wrong idea when it gets fancy. The boss was no lightweight, but Moose picked him up like a rag doll and dropped him in the corner pocket. Moose seemed a little dazed as he walked out, and I tagged after him down the street. That guy in there, he shouldn't have talked to me like that. Sure, sure, pal. What's the next stop? Who asked you to stick your face in? Remember me? I'm the detective you hired, Chunky. Oh, the name is Moose. Cut him, I'm large. Moose Malloy. That place ain't like it used to be. There used to be a stage and some boots. You said that. Maybe I told you too much. Maybe I... Let go my arm. Huh? We was to be married, me and Velma. Well, you figure I'd been them eight years I said about. Catching butterflies. San Quentin I'd been. Look, you find Velma for me, huh? Has she got a last name? Velma Valento. Now you beat it. Sure, sure. How do I get in touch with you? I get in touch with you. Tomorrow, maybe. So tomorrow comes, and I'm thinking about Moose Malloy and that bucket of mud look on the face of the boss and Florian's when I hear footsteps coming my way down the hall. Moose was coming back, except it wasn't Moose. It was another new customer. Good-looking guy, well-dressed, like a movie star. Mr. Marlowe, my name is Marion. Come in, come in. Who put in the pitch for me, Mr. Marion? Pitch? <laughs> oh, no one, no one. I, I saw your name in the classified section of the phone book. I'm in a clutch at the moment, Mr. Marion. you what? I'm busy. I couldn't take on anything big. What have you got in mind? I'd like your services tonight, for just a few hours. I'm meeting some men. I... I'm paying them some money. How much money and what for? I can't go into that. I've simply agreed to serve as the bearer of the money. Oh, you just want me to go along and hold your hand. I'm afraid I don't like your manner. Yeah, I've had complaints before, but it keeps getting worse. How much are you offering me for doing nothing? I hadn't got around to thinking about it. You suppose you could get around to thinking about it now? How would you like a swift punch on the nose? Oh, dear, I tremble at the thought of such violence. I, uh... I'll give you a hundred dollars. If that isn't enough, say it's so. It's enough. It's enough. This is all I can tell you. Some jewels were taken from a friend of mine in a holdup. I'm buying them back tonight. Where? I'm to drive my car to a rather secluded canyon near Malibu. Uh-huh. We drive out there to buy back some jewelry for a lady friend. I didn't say that. Chances are that these men, whoever they are, don't intend roughing you up if you play ball. But they wouldn't like you being twins. Now, one of us might get hurt. No, Mr. Marriott, I'm afraid I can't do anything for you. I see. But I'll take your hundred bucks and tag along for the ride. One more thing. Yes? I carry the shopping money and I do the driving. Very well. We drove down that night. Somehow I knew we were being watched. I didn't see anything. The fog was a nice dish of puree St. Germain. I felt it coming. I was a toad on a wet rock and a snake was looking down my neck. Slow down. We're getting near the spot. Shh, quiet. There should be some white posts along the road. Pull in your head. In back of the white post, there's the path. The path goes down into a hollow. That's where we're to wait. Hey, hey, look. Huh? White post. All right, stop the car. Now, you sit tight, and I'll go down and have a look-see. Have you got a flashlight? Yeah. Don't be more than a couple of minutes. 
Everybody here, Marriott? This whole setup looks like a tryout, seeing if you obey orders. Let's pull around the corner and... I caught the blackjack right behind my ear, and a black pool opened up at my feet. I dived in. It had no bottom. I uh, felt pretty good, just like an amputated leg. I don't know how much time went by. I forgot to look at my watch. But as I came to, I started to call for Marriott. Marriott. Marriott! Are you all right? What happened? Well, who, who are you? Oh. Hey, come back here. Come back here. Hello? Hello? Police headquarters. Let me talk to Randall, Inspector Randall. One moment, please. Inspector Randall? Randall, this is Marlowe. Marlowe? Oh, yeah? Yeah, look. I'm at a gas station down near Malibu, the foot of Woodbridge. So? You better get on here. A guy named Marriott's just been knocked off, beaten to death with a blackjack. <laughs> Randall, I told you a dozen times what happened. I'd like you to tell me again, here in my big, comfortable office. Who killed Marriott? An amateur killed him, or somebody who wanted it to look like an amateur. Nobody else would hit a man that many times with a sap. Ah, uh, the oftener you go over it, the sillier it sounds. I'd sooner dig eggshells out of a garbage can than information out of you. Oh, I get it. You don't like me. Okay, I'll go home. Right after you start talking sense. For instance? For instance, you don't know anything about Marriott. You don't know how much money you were carrying. You don't know what it was supposed to buy back. Trusting soul, wasn't he? Now, where's the dough? Where? Well, right after I beat out Marriott's brains, and just before I hit myself on the top of the head, I hid the money under a bush. Uh, and that dame you claim you saw? Yeah, she must have thought I was somebody else. She took one look and got out fast. Suppose a jewel outfit got the bright idea of using a private dick for contacts and uh, payoff. Oh, great, great. Now I'm a finger for a heist mob. Look. I'm trying to be helpful. I get up off the nice cold ground. I don't use the car because Marriott's still in it. I walk five miles just so you can be the first to hear the news. I wait for you at the beach and lead you straight to the body so you won't have to wait till next Christmas to find it. I tell you all I know, it sounds screwy. It is screwy, but it's all I know. Sure. Now I'm tired of your bum guesses. Either book me or let me go home. Milo, you'd slit your own throat for six bits plus federal tax. Now look, Randall. Go on home and keep your big yap shut. One phony move and you'll be locked up as a material witness. Whoever killed Marriott, I'll get him. Yeah, you'll get him. About the time you get your third set of teeth. And stay away from Marriott's pals. I've been after those boys for a long time and I'm getting close. So watch your step or I may have to pick you up in the same basket with Jules Amthor. Yeah? Hey, is Jules Amthor mixed up in this? Oh, so you know Amthor. I know lots of people in this town, but I never heard of Jules Amthor. Bad guess, Inspector. Good night, Randall. And keep away from the newspapers. I'll do the talking. Well, I went back to my office the next day. I didn't want to be there because my head felt like a nest of rivets. One of my clients was dead, but the other one was still alive, Moose Malloy. And I figured he might be looking for me. Early in the afternoon, this kid walks in. Yeah, business is getting better and better. Prettier. My name is Ann Ellison, Mr. Marlowe. I'm a reporter from the Post. Oh, have a seat, Miss Ellison. Police haven't been very helpful on the Marriott murder. I was wondering... There's a question I always ask. How did you know about me? Oh, friends at City Hall. Uh, tell me, did Marriott tell you who owned the jade he was buying back? No. No, he, he didn't. Had you known him long, Marriott? A couple of weeks. Why? Well, I just wondered if you had any theories about... about what happened or what was supposed to happen. Oh, I've, I've got a couple, yeah. Say, hey, this is a nice-looking purse. Just what do you mean by opening it? I'd like to prove another theory, that you're not a reporter... Why do dames carry so much stuff in a pocketbook? Give it to me. I was looking for a driver's license, but your bank book will do. And the name on this bank book isn't Allison at all. It's Grail. Ann Grail. Please. Oh, you're a hot rock, baby. I could toss you to the cops. Last night, all I could tell them was that Marriott was buying back some jewelry. You could knock their hats off of that line about the jade. Tell me, Miss Grail, have you ever known a girl named Velma Valento, a singer? I never heard of her in my life. Oh, well, it's just a shot in the dark. Besides, it's another case. I was just hoping. Who does that jade belong to? What's your interest in it? My interest? Well, Marriott gave me a hundred bucks to take care of him, and I didn't. I'm just a small businessman in a very messy business, but I like to follow through on a sale. 
The jade belongs to my father. Oh, I gathered from Marriott that the jade belonged to a lady. My father happens to be married. Oh, oh. Well, your mother was wearing it the night of the holdup. She's not my mother. My mother's dead. My father married again. Who sent you here to feel me out? It was my own brilliant idea. I saw your name in the newspaper. Well, before I talk to Inspector Randall, I think I'll have a talk with your father and your father's wife. My car's downstairs. Except that I'm expecting to hear from somebody. Well, in that case, Mr. Marlowe... In that case, I'll go with you just the same. You're really a lot cuter than Moose Malloy. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Before Dick Powell and his co-stars return with the second act of Murder, My Sweet, we take you to where there's a local war bond rally going on. And Mrs. White is curious about one of her fellow workers. Uh, Jean, stop here a minute, will you? Tell me, who is that attractive woman in charge of the next booth? Oh, that's Mrs. Jennings. Lovely looking, isn't she? Her daughter's a classmate of my Susie at college. Oh, now, Jean, don't tell me she's old enough to have a 20-year-old daughter. Well, she looks like a girl herself. It's her skin, I think. I've never seen her when a complexion didn't look like that. So soft and really fresh. Well, that's what a lovely luxe complexion does for a woman. Makes her look radiant, appealing. It's what you notice first about her appearance. That smooth, soft luxe complexion. Screen stars know how very important it is to have the charm of exquisite skin. That's why they're so careful never to take chances with complexion beauty. Here's what a famous star, Claudette Colbert, says. I never neglect my daily active lather facials with Lux Soap. They're so easy, and they work. Here's what I do. I cover my face generously with a creamy lather, work it in thoroughly. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and pat my face dry with a towel. Now my skin feels smoother, softer, and it is. These facials the screen stars depend on really do make skin lovelier. Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with daily Lux Toilet Soap Care. Why don't you try it? You'll enjoy the extra creamy lather, the gentle caressing way it touches your skin. Nine out of ten famous screen stars use fine white Lux Toilet Soap. Why don't you begin your daily facials with Hollywood Beauty Soap tomorrow? Irving Pitchell brings our stars back for the second act. With Dick Powell as Philip... Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy, we raise the curtain on Act Two of Murder, My Sweet. Philip Marlowe continues with his story. This girl, this Anne Grail, she drove me to her father's place in Brentwood, a cozy eight or nine acres. Okay for the average family, only you'd need a compass to go to the mailbox. House was all right, too, but it wasn't as big as Buckingham Palace. I waited while she sold me to the old folks. It was like waiting to buy a crypt in a mausoleum. And then she called me in. Old man Grail looked like a college professor, and the old lady... Hmm, what an old lady. Blonde, gorgeous, and I guess about 30, with a face and a shape that'd make most pen-up girls look like Gravel Gertie. She had dimples on her knees, and I was admiring them when the old man started to talk. Do you know anything about jade, Mr. Marlowe? It's, uh, green, isn't it? The jade stolen from my wife was a necklace, 60 beads of about six carats each. And very valuable, Mr. Marlowe. And there, why don't you sit down? What? Oh, yes. Now, how valuable? A somewhat larger necklace recently brought $125,000. Yes, I never should have worn it. It was stupid. Inexcusable. Where was the stick up? If you'll excuse me, I'm going to lie down. Mrs. Grail will talk to you. I'm most anxious to locate my jade, Mr. Marlowe. I can only hope it can be managed without any publicity. Wait a minute, Father. I'll go with you. May I mix you a drink, Mr. Marlowe? Uh, thanks. I hadn't thought there were enough murders these days to make detecting very attractive to a young man. Well, I stir up trouble on the side. Uh, tell me, uh, how much of your money was in Marriott's envelope? $8,000. Water or soda? Scotch. We assumed they'd never guess its real value. Who knew you were going to wear the necklace that night? My maid, perhaps. But I trust her implicitly. Why? Because I trust some people. I trust you. Did you trust Tom Marriott? In some things. You're not drinking, Mr. Marlowe. I thought detectives were heavy drinkers. Well, some detectives just encourage other people to drink. <laughs> Shall I tell you about the holdup? It uh, might help. 
Well, I'd been out dancing, and Tom was bringing me home. Where have you stopped? Oh, near here. Does it matter a lot? Oh, not too much at the moment, no. How many other guys take you out dancing? I'm very fond of my husband. Only his two-step's getting a little stiff. <laughs> Miss Grail, do you know Jules Amthor? I've heard Tom speak of him. Why? Oh, I don't know. The cops told me to leave Amthor alone. Is he a bad boy? A lot of Tom's friends are, I'm afraid. Tom was rather a heel himself, but a nice heel. <sighs> you don't know how horrible I feel. Why? Why? Because I'm responsible. I asked Tom to try to buy the necklace back. Oh, I, I just can't understand the whole business. All they took was a necklace. I was wearing a ring, too, but they didn't want the ring. Uh, about Jules Amthor, wh what's his racket? Well, he's sort of a psychic consultant. I think he's a quack. Tom went to him because he was all mixed up. He, he couldn't get started for fear of failure. I wonder if he'd take my case. That sounded like the door closing. It was. Anne's been standing there. Oh, strange child. Mr. Marlowe, you will help me, won't you? Why? Because you like me or are you paying me something in money? Well, I've never hired a detective before. What are the rates? As much as a traffic will bear. How do I find Amthor? <laughs> well, he's really quite inaccessible. Yes? Mr. Amthor is here, Mrs. Gray. Well, show him in. Well, don't look so smug. He really is inaccessible. I didn't have the faintest idea he'd be coming. Mr. Marlowe, how do you spend your evenings? I'm in the phone book. Mrs. Grail. Oh, come in, Mr. Amthor. This is Mr. Marlowe. Oh, how do you do? Mr. Marlowe is a private detective. He was with Tom when... when it happened. Oh? I was hired as a bodyguard and bungled the job. Now it's myself I'm investigating. Oh, these things are so difficult to believe. What could have happened? I've got a couple of notions... Would you like to help me work them out? Oh, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't make a good detective, Mr. Marlowe, and I'm... Yeah, I know, I know. You're inaccessible. The police told me to keep away from you. You look harmless to me. I'll be very glad to arrange an interview. Just leave your number with Mrs. Grave. Oh, don't go to any special trouble. I'll bring my own crystal ball. Hey, how do you get out of this fun house? <laughs> I was home that night trying to add things up. Moose Malloy, Marriott, Helen the Beautiful Blonde, and Jules Amthor. I put it all together and it just thumbed its nose at me. I decided to go down to Florian's cafe and split an infinitive with the boss when the buzzer changed my plans. I had a visitor, Helen Grail. I just dropped in because I thought you'd be interested in what Amthor had to say. Oh, and here. Shall we call this a retainer? Yeah, let's call it a retainer. Mr. Marlowe, do the police know about me? Would that bother you? Well, my husband has a morbid fear of publicity, and, and he's not at all well. Oh, I'll manage it. Now, about Amthor. Oh, please. I don't like being rushed. I was hoping we could go out somewhere. Do you like the Coconut Beach Club? I've never been there. I'm the drive-in type. <laughs> <laughs> the lights there are very flattering. They'd even mellow you a little, I think. But it's the sort of a place where you're expected to wear shoes and a tie. Mm. I'll be right with you. We went to the Coconut Beach Club. We had a table in the corner. She gave me that dreamy smile and started asking questions. You know, you've got a nice build for a private detective. Oh, it gets me around. How does one get to be a private detective? <laughs> you don't mind my sizing you up a little? Well, most of us are ex-cops. I worked for the district attorney. Got canned. Surely not for incompetence. Uh, for talking back. I had an interesting childhood, too, but you didn't drop in on me to get a biography. You'd rather I talked about Amthor. That's right, a good guess. Well, then, stay right here. I've got to powder my nose, and then I'll tell you all about it. Well, just be back before I get stuck with a check. Mr. Marlowe, I'd like to talk with you. Well, hello, Miss Gale. I'd like to talk to you, too, but not now. Do the Grails always hold their family reunions here? It won't take long, what I have to say. Look, honey, I've already got a date. She'll be right back, and I don't want you two slugging it out in public. Mm, there's no danger of that. She won't be back. How do you know? Never mind. What did Helen ask you to do? She wanted me to kiss her and find her jade necklace. I may have the order wrong, but that's the general idea. Well, whatever she was willing to pay you, I'll pay you more. Just stay away from her. 
Why do you look at me like that? I don't know. I seem to remember you from one of my better dreams. You, you, you know, if I... Now what are you looking at? I'll be right back. Uh, hello, Mr. Malloy. Do you like this place better than Florian's? This the babe. I got something for you to do. Look, look, I'm a big boy now. Don't you want me to have any fun at all? I want you should meet a guy. Will you let go of me? Another ten seconds and gangrene will set in these fingers. Thanks. Okay, I'll ditch the babe. I couldn't ditch the babe. The babe had ditched me. First Helen had disappeared, and now Anne. Anne had left a card on the table. She'd written on it, I'll keep the offer open. I don't live in Brentwood. My address is 962 North Hoover Street. Moose saw me put the card in my pocket. He came over and hustled me out to the curb. There was a car waiting, also a guy to drive the car. He took us to a very ritzy apartment house, showed us up to the penthouse, and then did something that made me rather unhappy. You, uh, you carry a gun, Pally? Oh, I'm so used to packing one that hardly notices on me. I think maybe I better hold it, eh? Stop the stalling. Let's get inside. He was there, all right, Mr. Amter. Me and Moose got him. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Amthor, I'd like to, uh, to ask him about Velma. Don't be impatient. You and Michael wait in the other room. Come on, big boy. <clears throat> but you ask him quick. I want to know now. Where did, well, you, where did you pick up Moose Malloy? We uh, met at Mrs. Grail's. You said you wanted an interview. Huh? I must insist upon some sort of logical progression. We'll come to Moose Malloy later. As for my profession, my patients regard me highly as a psychic consultant, Mr. Marlowe. Years ahead of my time. Which might be one way of saying that some folks have made some complaints to the cops. It might be. Do you have another theory about me? Yeah, yeah, I do, and it goes like this. Marriott blackmailed rich women, but somebody else found the women for him. Oh. Well, if you're right, I would be that somebody, and I would have Mrs. Grail's jade necklace, wouldn't I? Unless something went wrong, like Marriott losing his nerve and ringing in a private dick, a sucker who'd risk his neck for a C-note who might figure a jade necklace would be a nice thing to have in his bank. And would this hypothetical detective be willing to part with it for a consideration? Could be, if he had it. How much of a consideration? Well, it's difficult to say until he produces the jade. He might be bluffing, trying to gain information. In which case, a great psychic, uh, years ahead of his time, might try to beat the truth out of him. You wouldn't suggest that? Only if you wanted to wear your face backwards for a while. No, no, there's no need for us to be at each other's throats, Mr. Marlowe. And there's really no need for subterfuge. Putting it on the simplest and friendliest terms. I want that jade. I suppose I don't have it. I suppose I don't want to sell. You got him to tell you yet? No, Malloy, I asked him where Velma is. He refuses to tell me. Now, wait a minute. I don't like you not tell me where you got Velma. Well, if Amthor told you I know where Velma Valento is, he's nuts. He just picked you up to do his dirty work. I gave you some dough to find her. Well, keep your shirt on and stop dancing me around. He's lying, Malloy. He knows. Where you got her? I haven't got her, you dimwit. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have hit me. All right, now, the two of you. Stay just where you are. What do you got to pull a gun for? Where's that necklace, Marlowe? If you tell me, I can stop Moose. I don't know. Very well, Moose. He's yours. Make him talk. So Moose went to work. Those fingers went around my throat tighter and tighter. That black pool opened up at my feet again, and I dived in. The rest of it was a crazy, cold-cut dream. I was going somewhere. I'd never been there before. I was drugged. Somebody had filled me full of juice. I was in the land of poppies, and I met a lot of interesting people. Necklace, Mr. Marlowe. Where is the necklace? I'm all right. What happened? I'm all right. You should have hit me like that. You should have hit me. Somebody, please help. Hey, what's in here? Oh, no, it's the smoke. The smoke. The room's full of smoke. I don't see no smoke. You want I should blow it away? No. Where am I? Anything else you'd like to know? Yeah, yeah. The doors are too small. Stairs are made of dough. I don't see no stairs. I think the guy is nuts. Do you think he's nuts? Oh, uh, skip it. Get out. I want to go to sleep. I want to sleep again. 
Better make it just that. Then I knew I couldn't go to sleep. Not if I wanted to stay alive. I could still feel those fingers on my throat. I even saw them. Just a bunch of bananas that looked like fingers. I wondered what I was full of. Something to keep me quiet, or was that dope to make me talk? Maybe both. Okay, Marlo, I said to myself, you're a tough guy. You've been sapped, choked, and shot in the arm till you're crazy as a couple of waltz and mice. But you gotta get up and start moving. Let's see you do something really tough like putting on your pants. Well, I made it. Okay, you cuckoo. Your pants are on, now walk. Now talk. What about? Anything, everything. Just talk and keep walking. You're getting out of here. Walk! I walked, I don't know how long. That kind of time they don't make in a watch. And then the smoke went away. The room turned into a room and I knew I was ready to talk to somebody. I tore the bed apart and got a hunk of bed spring, and then I started to shout again. Help! Help! Mike walked in again, and I let him have it. Oh, that was a nice feeling. I crept down the stairs. There was a man in an office. The doctor's office, it looked like. I was in front of him before he saw me, but his hand went for the buzzer right away. That buzzer won't buy anything tonight, Doc. I just gave Nursey a sleeping tablet. For three days, sir, you have been a very sick man. Three days? You're swaying right now. Don't you realize that? I'm, I'm all cured, Doc. Now, what were you saying? I made no remark. I thought I heard you saying that you had a gun in that desk. And that if, that if you were very careful, you could sneak it out. A very stupid thing to do, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, a gun. It's better. Now, talk some more. You've been suffering from narcotic poisoning. On account of you, pop me full of it. Speak up, Dr. Jekyll. I'm in a wild mood tonight. I haven't shot a man in a week. You very nearly died, sir. I had to give you digitalis. Also a little something to make me talk. What was I supposed to talk about? Maybe a jade necklace I haven't got? Mr. Amthor will be disappointed in you again. Never disappoint Mr. Amthor, Doc. It depresses him. I'm warning you, Mr. Marlowe. At any moment, you'll collapse. I must insist on your going back to bed. Get away from me. A gun, please. I want that gun. You're going to faint, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, but not on this carpet. I'll do my folding on a nice hard street. You'll never reach that door. Well, before I try, I'm going to rip something off. No, not your head. Just a telephone. So long, Doc. I'll look you up when I get insomnia again. I staggered out to the street and down to the corner... Then I thought I was seeing things again. Yep, there he was, Moose Malloy. I couldn't have knocked the ashes off a cigarette, but I tried to swing on him. He just held me up and started talking. You shouldn't have to fight with me. You ain't in such good shape. I'll, I'll murder you. I don't like to fight with nobody. I want for you to keep looking for Velma. Who planted you here, Amthor? Amthor tells me about you. But he was kidding all the time. Uh, he was kidding the pants off you, Buster. He doesn't want you to find your girl. Nobody's supposed to find Velma. He's got other plans. You ain't in such good shape. I'd better help you. Then get me a cab, you dopey gorilla. Where do you want to go? What's that card you got? It says 962 North Hoover Street on the card. You saw me pick up this card in the Coconut Beach Club. That's where the babe lives, huh? Yeah, I think I'll find out why she's living alone and if she really likes it. Now get me a cab. What do you want? Black coffee, Miss Grail. Eggs and a scotch and soda. You're drunk. You better get out before... Hey, I... this is a nice place here. Is there room for you in the Brentwood Palace, or don't you like it out there? Why did you come here? Because the cops may be looking for me, and I'm not ready to talk. If you're not drunk, why do you look the way you do? Yeah, ask the second Mrs. Grail. She fixed up a blind date for me, with Jules Amthor and a couple of his whipping boys. What happened? Are you all right? Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be alive. I'm... Say that again. Say what again? The last thing you said. I said, what happened? Are you all right? Miss Grail, what were you doing out there in the canyon the night Marriott was killed? I was lying on my face when somebody threw a flashlight and asked me if I was all right, and then she said, what happened? Yeah, a girl with red hair and a crooked nose and a nice figure. Yes, 
A girl named Anne Grail. I didn't kill Marriott. You weren't out there just taking a hike. I didn't kill him. I'd say you overheard Marriott and your stepmother making some sort of arrangements about the jade. What if I did? You knew Marriott had been holding hands with her and you didn't like that. I hate her. And you hated him, too. You hated anybody that had anything to do with Helen, so you bumped him off. You killed Tom Marriott. I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. A brief intermission before our stars return in the third act of Murder, My Sweet. Meanwhile, it's 2.45 of a bright afternoon, just the day for Mary to be hard at work in her victory garden. There, that'll hold those pesky weeds for a while. Hello, Johnny. Telegram for me? What in the world? Have 48-hour pass, arriving 5.15. See you soon, darling. Signed, Jim. Oh, heavens to Betsy. He'll be here in a few hours. I'd die if he saw me like this. The house has got to be slicked up, too, and I've just got to fix something special for dinner. Well... Here goes. Got to work fast. Now it's 3.45. Mary has accomplished wonders. Is giving the furniture one last polish. There. That looks something like it. And now to press my dress. The blue and green print Jim loves so. Now it's 4.45. The dress is ready, the dinner started, and there's still a half an hour to go. Oh, goodness, I feel all in. Glad there's time for my Lux Soap beauty bath. That'll do the trick. Hmm, this lather's wonderful. So rich and creamy. I feel like a different person already. And I love this nice perfume Lux Soap please on my skin. Makes me forget all the work I've done and feel like Jim's girl again. And now it's 5.30 and Jim is here. Gosh, you're lovely, Mary. What makes you so sweet? So many clever girls depend on their Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath for a quick, refreshing beauty pickup. But most important of all, they know this secret. When I step for my Lux Soap Bath, I know my skin is fresh and really sweet. Scream stars say a daily Lux soap bath makes you sure of daintiness. And I've found they're right. Screen stars, lovely women everywhere, discovered long ago their fine white complexion soap, Lux toilet soap, makes an exquisite bath soap, too. The extra creamy lather, rich and abundant even in hard water, leaves skin flower fresh. And screen stars tell you they love Lux toilet soap's delicate clinging perfume, too. Why not get some of Hollywood's fragrant Lux toilet soap for your beauty bath tomorrow? It's thrifty to use. You'll find each satin smooth cake lasts and lasts. Back now to Irving Pitchell and our stars. The curtain rises on Act Three of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. Philip Marlowe is in the apartment of Anne Grail, whom he has just accused of murder. <laughs> I stood there in Ann Grail's apartment and accused her of killing Marriott. I was sure she hadn't done it, but I had to find out what she knew. I know just what you're thinking. If I didn't kill him, my father did. And if he did, you'd do anything to protect him? No. No, he couldn't do such a thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't buy it either yet. I was just trying it on for size. Won't you please go home? I, I'm expecting a date. I, I, I can't go home. There's a very stubborn character named Inspector Randall. And if he isn't on my doorstep right now waiting to pick me up, then two of his stooges are. So relax. It... Hey, your date? Probably. Wait here. Tell him you've decided to have a quiet little supper with me. Yes? My name's Randall. I'd like a word with your boyfriend. Oh, I was just talking about you, Inspector. I've been looking for you for three days. Pull up a chair. Miss Grail was about to fix some soft-boiled eggs and scotch. You wouldn't join us. Last time I saw you, I gave you some good advice. I guess it didn't take, huh? I didn't bother Amthor. I was going to, but I didn't get around to it. He got to me. Yeah, he gave me quite a party. How did it go? What did it buy me? This is straight, Randall. You'd like to get Amthor, and I'd like to help you. He annoyed me a little. I'm listening. Well, Amthor's a tough turkey. He works some kind of blackmail routine on dames who come to him with problems. I think Marriott was his contact man. Let's get to the new part, huh? Uh, the jewelry Marriott was after was a jade necklace that belonged to one of Amthor's patients. Well, Marriott fumbled the ball. Yeah? So Amthor figured I had it. 
he sent me to a little rest home where the teacher to talk. There's a guy there who's a whiz with a hypo. The address is 23rd and Descanso. Okay, okay. Who owns the jade? I told you, one of Amthor's patients. By the name of, uh... I don't know. Oh, Miss Grail. Yes? When were you last to your father's place in Brentwood? Not for several days. Is something wrong? Skip it, skip it. Marlowe, I figure what you told me is on the level. But don't make a habit of trying to help me. I might get grateful and lock you up. Uh, give me a call tomorrow. How could he know about me? I don't know. That's what happens when you let a cop go to school. He gets smart. <laughs> now fix up your face. We, we got to get out of the marble quarry. Where? Brentwood. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, it's a funny thing. About every third day I get hungry. I, I can fix eggs and coffee if you want to wait. You know, you're crazy. Everybody takes a poke at you. They fill, fill you full of drugs, but you bounce right back and hit between tackle and end all over again. And I don't think you even know which team you're on. I don't know which team anybody's on. I don't even know who's playing today. At Brentwood, we saw Mr. Grail, and I've seen healthier-looking gents in the county morgue. His face was gray with worry. Something was eating him. More important than a missing jade necklace. A missing wife. Helen left yesterday. I haven't heard from her since. And have you seen her? Have you? No, dear, but maybe... Well, maybe she went to the beach house. Beach house? It had been rented to Marriott indirectly through the bank. Well, I think I'd better have a look at it. This whole thing has gone too far. Oh? Or maybe it's coming too close to home. Mr. Grail, I don't say you killed Marriott, but you could have, for a good old-fashioned motive. I did not kill him, Mr. Morrow, but I say it is better that he is dead. I'm not concerned if the police suspect me. I'm concerned about my wife. I, I'm losing her. Father, And that please. is why I say all this has got to stop. You drop the case, Mr. Morrow. I'll pay you well. Oh, fine. I get dragged in, get money shoved at me. I get pushed out, get money shoved at me. Everybody pushes me in, everybody pushes me out. Nobody wants me to do anything. Okay, skip it. I'll put a check in the mail. Yeah, well, I cost a lot to do nothing. I get restless. Throw on a trip to Mexico. Father, where are you... Stay here. Why? Because I want a key to that beach house. But you just told him. I can't stop now. Do the cops stop? Does Helen stop? Do you stop? What do you mean, does, does Helen stop? Oh, I don't know. If I always knew what I meant, I'd be a genius. You're vicious. You get some horrible satisfaction seeing people torn apart. Sister, you're hanging on to something that's going to smack you hard. If I stick, it smacks you sooner, sooner and cleaner. Maybe that's why I'm sticking. Oh, but I'd stick anyway, because a guy who hired me got killed. I'll... I'll get you the key. We went to the beach house. Things happened there. Some of them I can explain. One thing I can't. After we took a, lo took a look around, Anne and I were standing there in the dark, looking out that big front window toward the ocean, and before I knew it, we were in a clinch. Oh, it's nice to kiss a girl like Anne Grail. I told her she had a cute little face, even if her nose was slightly crooked. It isn't crooked. Just has a bump on it where I got hit with a baseball. I used to play shortstop. Philip. Yeah? What about my father? If we don't find I'm Helen... going to make you mad now, baby. But here goes. Your father really loves Helen. When I came along, you were afraid she might turn me into another Marriott. So you tried to buy me off. That didn't work, and I began to suspect your father. A real tough guesser might say that when he couldn't buy me off either, you decided to be nice to me. Like just now. There's nothing decent about you, is there? Nothing at all. I, I don't always guess right. I, I may be wrong. I think I am wrong. Sometimes I hate all men. Young men, handsome men who don't work for a living and, and almost heels who are private detectives. <laughs> Helen. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. But you should know by now that men play rough. They soften you up and then they belt you one. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I didn't finish, Helen. I hate a lot of women, too. Especially beautiful, expensive blondes. All bubble bath and moonlight. And, and inside, cold and hard like blue steel. Only not that clean. Your slip is showing, darling. I'm leaving. I'll tell Father you're here. Well, how long have you been here, Mrs. Grail? Since yesterday. You just happened to leave the Brentwood... 
place before the cops dropped in on your husband? Oh, please. Look, you hired me to get your necklace, so you stand me up at a corny rum joint and tell Amthor. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you might have had the jade. Please, please don't blame me. You could have had it. What Amthor did, was it bad? Uh, it almost made me mad. Yeah. <laughs> now, just what goes between you two? Well, he's blackmailing me. Well, that much even I can figure out. My husband is in love with me. I'm, I'm fond of him, and I'm grateful, but I find other men very attractive. I imagine they meet you halfway. I met Amthor through Tom Marriott. He's smart. He does know psychology. He got me talking, and of course I talked too much. He uncovered something, and the blackmailing started. I think if my husband had found out, it would have killed him. So you agreed to give Amthor the necklace? But before I could, it was stolen. By Marriott? Must have been. Amphor probably came to the same conclusion. He decided to kill him, and that's why Marriott wanted you for protection. All right, I'll, I'll buy it up to there. What happens now? I want you to help me kill Jules Amphor. Don't you see? You're the only one I can turn to. It's the only way I'll ever have peace. He'll never be satisfied, even if he does get the jade. Why me? Because I have a gun or just because I wear pants? Oh, please. Please, I need you so. <laughs> I need help and peace desperately. I need you. Have you got anything worked out? Yes, but Amthor's disappeared. Uh, maybe I can find him. Well, then tell him you've got the jade and you're ready to sail. Then what? Well, that's my part. All right, uh, I'll dig him up. Oh, you're... You're wonderful. How would you like not having to earn a living? Wouldn't bother me a bit. <sighs> When will you be back? Uh, I may have a time finding him. Maybe not till tomorrow night. Oh, would you mind kissing me goodbye? No, Please. I wouldn't mind at all. I went straight to Amthor's apartment. I had a couple of keys, and one of them fitted the back door. I wanted to surprise Amthor. I thought it would give him a bang. I thought it would kill him. Amthor was on the living room floor. He wasn't must, just snapped, the way a pretty girl would snap a stalk of celery. Only for this job, you'd have to be a big man with a big pair of hands. I hustled downtown, bought a late edition. I wanted to see how the police were doing on the Marriott murder. And while I was looking at the paper, somebody was looking at me. I've been trying to find you all over. I got to go away. Yeah, yeah, Amthor's dead. I know, you didn't mean to kill him. You just shook him too hard because he wouldn't tell you where Velma is. You find her? Yeah, Moose, I find her. Where is she? You tipped the Johns off on her. I wouldn't want little Velma to do no stretch. Turn me loose. Turn me loose and stop waltzing me around. If the Johns got Velma... Nobody's got her. She's got herself. Now, yeah, you can see her tomorrow. Okay. Now, go hide yourself and be here tomorrow night as soon as it gets dark. Moose showed up tonight like I told him. I sold him on waiting outside the beach house until I called him. That was like lighting a stick of dynamite and telling it not to go off. But I had a plan. Helen was waiting for me. Philip, Philip, did you find him? Did you find Amthor? He'll be here around 12. 12. Would you like to look at this? Hmm? This is it, Philip. The necklace. Where'd you get it? I went to Brentwood today. Got it out of my dressing table drawer. Surprise. In a flabbergasted sort of way, yes. It was never stolen. You faked the whole thing? I simply wasn't going to let Amphil get it. When he comes, he can take a look at it. Well, he, he may have a gun. He'll never get that far. So have I. You went to Brentwood. Then where's Anne and your father? I can't say. They were out. And now I'm going to be very grateful. Here, the necklace. It's yours. You're much too nice to be a grubby detective all your life. You told Marriott this thing had been stolen. Why? Well, he was close to Amthor. They both had to think it was stolen. Marriott fell for that? Of course. And you still think Amthor killed him? Who else? You. Oh, no. No, you, you can't mean that. Yes, I think Marriott was scared because he'd agreed to help you kill a nosy detective. The same detective Moose took to Florian's joint, the one Florian told Marriott about. Marriott had to help you protect his interest. You knew that. You were a living to him and to Amthor and, his, and in his modest way to Florian. You supported them. They knew you wouldn't be worth blackmailing if I found you for Moose Malloy. Oh, no, no, so I was nifty thinking, darling. 
At the canyon, one of us would get out of the car. It didn't matter who. Either way, you had Marriott and me separated, and you'd tag us one at a time and get your 8,000 bucks and knock off Amthor later. Yeah, it might have worked, too, if it hadn't been for Ann chasing down there after you. Of course, my head's pretty hard. It's true. It's all true. Everybody was closing in on me. I didn't know which way to turn. And it almost worked, sister. I was almost as dead as Marriott. But killing a man with a blackjack, oh, that's no work for a lady. Well, after, after it happened, I, I didn't know what you would do. But now I'm, I'm so close to peace. So close. Just, just Amthor. But I can't face it alone. Don't desert me now. Sure. Amthor blackmailed you. He's got something on you, only it isn't what you told me. It isn't just men. Your husband could understand the men. No, it's the clink looming up. And it's no good understanding the clink. Moose is looking for you, Velma. Where is he? Where is Moose? Waiting for me to call him in. Eight years ago when you were his girl, what did you talk Moose into doing? He went to jail for you. Was it murder or something serious? Where are you going? To tell him that his red head has turned blonde. Come back. Huh? Oh. Oh, a gun. Well, well, it fits your personality better than a blackjack. And the pearl handle goes swell with your fingernail polish. You know, it's too bad it has to be like this. Don't move. Who is it? Well, well, come in, come in. Hello. Darling, that gun, what are you... Close that door, Anne. Your timing, dear, gets worse and worse. We've been listening. Why didn't you tell me you were in such trouble? I wanted to spare you. I might have been able to prevent all this. Now, of course, it's too late, Mr. Marlowe. I see your point. Helen, if Mr. Amthor is coming, I think perhaps you'd better do it quickly. Father! Get inside, dear. Keep your hands up, Mr. Marlowe. I'll have to take your gun. I'll be with Anne, Helen. Oh, all by ourselves again. Yes, you know, this will be the first time I ever killed anyone I knew so little about and, and like so much. You and I, <laughs> just a couple of mugs. <laughs> but we could have got along. What's stopping us now? I can handle Moose. He broke Amthor's neck yesterday. What did you say? Something I shouldn't have. Amthor is dead. Yeah? Then that leaves only you. I'm sorry, but you know too... <laughs> Too, too much. I had to do it, Mr. Marlowe. I had to kill her. Hello, hello. Let's have the police. Give me that phone. Give it to me. Don't you realize he saved your life? Why must you suffer for that? The cops always like to solve murders done with my gun. She's dead, isn't that enough? She was evil, all evil. I think I hear a shot, Mr. Marlowe. I think I better come in. Moose. Moose, it didn't work out the way I planned. Never mind. I'd like to talk to Velma now. I'd... Moose. Don't touch her. She ain't hardly changed. Just like always. Cute as a bug's ear. I wasn't going to bother her none. She done all right? Who done this? I did. You shouldn't have killed her. Moose. You shouldn't have killed Velma. Moose. Get out of my way. Don't come any closer, please. Moose, will you listen to me? Moose! <laughs> That old black pit opened up again right on schedule. Blacker than the others and deeper. Well, that's the works. That's all I know on account I didn't see so well with my eyeballs scorched. They didn't keep me long at the hospital. Two hours ago, Randall came and picked me up. And everything I've been telling you, I've been telling him. He's sitting right here in front of me now. I wish I could see Randall. Wish the bandage wasn't on my face. I want to look at his ugly kisser and figure what he's thinking. Milo? Huh? There's a piece of paper here on my desk, a warrant for your arrest. I'm tearing it up. Oh, thanks. Uh, tonight, uh, when it happened, I, I heard the shots. I still don't know who got hit. It wasn't the kid, was it, Randall? No. No, you can get out of here now if you want to. You mean I'm sprung? Who backed me up? Who got shot? I heard three. Moose Malloy. Dead? Yes, and Grail. While they were fighting for the gun. Anne's okay, then. Huh. She thought it over while I was in the hospital and came around and backed me up, right? I didn't say. <laughs> McNulty, see if he gets home. Yeah. I'll buy you a ride in a cab, Marlowe. Hey, what are you putting in my pocket? The necklace. She gave it to you, didn't she? 
Yeah, I tried it on. It's wrong for my complexion. Then give it to your girlfriend. Strangle yourself with it. No, just go on, beat it. Let's go, Marlowe. Now, you can come in now, Miss Grail. Why didn't you tell him? Why did you have to keep him guessing? About your backing him up? Why don't you tell him? You can catch him outside. Just give Nolte the high sign. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, nothing. Yeah? What do you know about that redhead pitching for me? Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, are we alone or am I hearing things? Uh, what things? Like someone else is walking with us. Oh, you're on the street. Lots of people walk on the street. Oh, oh. Hmm. She had a cute figure, huh? I, I didn't notice. Hmm. You must be low on vitamins. <laughs> oh, she had more than a figure, too. Not a beautiful face, but a good face. Uh, I didn't notice. Mm, face like a Sunday school picnic. Oh, there's a cab down the block. Say, are you sure we're alone? Hey, hey, cab! Yes, sir. Oh, well, I guess she thought I liked the blonde chewing on my face. I wish I could tell her. I wish I could... Duck your head, Marlowe. This here's the cab. Where to, mister? 800 South Kingsley. Yes, sir. Hey, Nalti, I... <laughs> hey, what goes? If I didn't have these bandages over my eyes... You go to the same address, too, lady? Uh, Nalti, I haven't kissed anybody in a long time. Would it be all right if I kissed you, Nalti? I think it would be just fine. I said, are you going to the same... Oh. Oh, yeah, I guess you are. <laughs> now that we've cleared Dick Powell of murder, the rest of our cast can get back on their feet and join him at the footlights for a curtain call. You should have been in tonight's cast, Irving. You used to play in pictures. Well, thanks, Dick. But I'm too old to go through what you went through in tonight's play. Tell me, Claire, how does it happen that a nice girl like you always gets to play the bad girl roles? Oh, I don't know, Irving. I guess they've got me typed. They had Dick Powell typed for a while, but look what he's doing now. That's right, June. Next week, he starts a whole new radio series as a tough detective. You mean I might yet get a chance to play a sweet young housewife? And how about me, Mr. Pitchell? Do you think I could play Hansel and Gretel with Margaret O'Brien? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you took a course in compression, Mike. You mean expression. No, I mean compression. Or else learn to walk on your knees and keep your hands behind your back. <laughs> uh, well, what do we do with June Dupre, Irving? Well, we just pat her on both cheeks and tell her to stay as sweet as she is. Oh, now, here, you aren't falling for that Lux complexion pitch. Why not? Other men have. That's right, Irving. That's why so many of us use Lux toilet soap. Look, uh, Pitch, while we're getting everybody out of acting ruts, what, uh, what sort of a role would you give yourself if you went back to acting? Well, you were mostly a heavy in pictures, weren't you? Yes, and I rather fancy myself in a light musical comedy part. You know, the kind of bright young chap who sings, Smile the while, let a smile be your style. You... <laughs> Look, Irving, I, I think you'd better stick to making pictures. Incidentally, I understand from Paramount that you did great things with a medal for Benny. Well, I had a good story there to work with, Dick. A homeboy whose rival in love is an overseas hero. And a good cast. I'm looking forward to it, Irving. But uh, tell me, what do you have on Lux next week? Well, for next week, we have an altogether charming story with a most delightful cast. The Canterville Ghost, starring Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake. Take a group of high-spirited American commandos, build them in an ancient British castle where their hostess is Lady Margaret O'Brien, and then haunt that castle by the most notorious ghost in England, and you have the elements of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's entertaining and extraordinary comedy. The Canterville Ghost can haunt my house next Monday, Pitch. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And all our thanks. This week, America salutes the Army's famous Quartermaster Corps on its 107th anniversary. The oldest supply branch of the armed forces, the Fighting Quartermasters, are seeing to it that American soldiers are the best fed, best clothed, best cared for fighting men in history. Theirs has been a gallant contribution to the cause of freedom. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Lawton, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake in The Canterville Ghost. This is Irving Pitchell saying good night from Hollywood.
Every day, as the war against Japan increases in intensity, the need for waste fats and greases grows more critical. Here's one department where the enemy may be superior unless you help make up the difference from your kitchens. Save all waste fats and greases, no matter how discolored. Keep a clean can in which to strain them and take them regularly to your butcher. Remember, for every pound, he'll give you four cents plus two extra meat points. Murder, My Sweet was presented through the cooperation of RKO Studios, producers of Enchanted Cottage. Dick Powell appeared through the courtesy of the Fitch Bandwagon and will shortly be seen in the RKO picture Cornered. Claire Trevor will soon appear in RKO's Johnny Angel. Mike Mazurki is currently working on the RKO version of Dick Tracy. Heard in tonight's cast were Cy Kendall, Gerald Moore, Robert Regent, Norman Field, Eddie Marr, Dora Singleton, Charles Seal, Ed Emerson, and Leo Sharon. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear The Canterville Ghost with Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake. From Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. William Holden and Colleen Gray in Appointment with Danger. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The famous Canadian Mounted Police have a reputation for always getting their man. We have the same tenacious, persistent federal agents in our own country. And one of them is the Postal Inspector. In tonight's drama, Paramount Pictures has presented our agent with an assignment that turns into an exciting appointment with danger. And as our stars, we have that popular actor, William Holden, and playing opposite him, lovely Colleen Gray. Now, Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Alan Goddard and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine. The United States Post Office is the biggest business in the world. Every year it handles 45 billion pieces of mail and enough money to pay off the personal debts of everyone in the country. Policing that activity is the job of 800 postal inspectors. This is an account of one of those jobs, and it begins in La Porte, Indiana, where a few hours ago the body of Inspector Harry Gruber was found in an alley. And now in the city post office, what you say makes sense, I suppose. Gruber was either drunk when they strangled him or asleep. But he never drank, so he must have been asleep. Here in Laporte? Well? I don't believe it, Maury. He was killed somewhere else and brought here. That could be any place. Gruber was on a floating assignment all over Indiana. Yeah. Well, it's a rat race now. Until we find that nun. Nun? Oh, you, uh, you mean one of those sisters? That's right. She was passing that alley last night. She saw two men walking with Gruber, supporting him. When she asked if anything was wrong, one of the men said something about their friend being drunk, so she just kept going. Well, don't try to blame her. I'm not. Fortunately, she passed a policeman not long after and told him, but the cop was on a call. By the time he got back to the alley, all he found was Gruber's body. Mm-hmm. What about that nun? Where is she? We don't know. The police have checked every nun here in Laporte. Not one of them was anywhere near that alley last night. Well, did they bother to check the railroads? Railroads, planes, and buses. Nothing. Well, she's got to be around someplace. How many nuns are there, anyway? I don't know, Al. I never counted them. You're a big help. I'll be even less help. I've got to get back to Washington tonight. From here on in, this is your case. Stay with it, Al. Don't worry. I'll find that nun. I hope so. But you've been chasing hoodlums for so long, you don't know how to treat ordinary people. Warm up, will you? Oh, sure. I'll fall in love for you. I don't think you could, because you don't know what a love affair is. It's what goes on between a man and a forty-five pistol that doesn't jam. Al, let me tell you about you. That badge and a few law books have turned you into a nut. You don't like anybody, you don't believe anybody, you don't trust anybody. You think everybody has a pit? Everybody has. You, I, everybody. We're all working for ourselves. A better job, a little more dough, a round of applause. One way or another, everybody you meet is a pitch artist. Uh, skip it. Just keep me posted. 
And remember, the biggest thing on your side isn't a pair of brass knuckles. It's time and work and patience. Thanks, thanks. Now, do you mind if I start trying to find out who killed Harry Gruber? No. No, and I'm sure you will, Al. Because you're a good cop. That's about all you are. A turn from Goddard. Have lead on none. Railroad brakeman reports seeing two nuns aboard express same night Gruber was killed. Train was en route to Fort Wayne, and so am I. Mr. Goddard, the Mother Superior said you wanted to see me. I'm Sister Augustine. I've been looking for you for three days, Sister. I'm a post office inspector. Oh, how nice. I'm here investigating a murder. Oh, well, I'm sure we wouldn't know anything about that. This is a school, Mr. Goddard, an academy. Yes, I know. I followed you here from Laporte to Fort Wayne and now back here. But this, that's not important. What is, is that last Tuesday night you saw three men in an alley in Laporte. Why, yes. Yes, I did. But you were on a train, weren't you? Why, that's remarkable. How did you know? Because I checked the bus lines and the airlines and the railroads. You were on a train that doesn't even stop at Laporte. Well, it certainly did on Tuesday night. There was a tie-up of some kind just outside the freight yard. The train stopped, and the conductor said we'd be delayed at least a half hour, so I got off. Why? To get some medicine at a drugstore. Sister Paula, I was traveling with her, wasn't feeling well. Well, neither was the guy in the alley. He was dead. A government agent named Harry Gruber. Oh, how terrible. Did he have a family? What's the difference, sister? He's just as dead either way. Really, Mr. Goddard? The point is, could you identify either of the men who were in the alley with him? Well, one of them, perhaps. He was rather pleasant. He told me the man was intoxicated. Look, would you mind coming with me and checking the police files? They have quite a collection of pictures. Oh, I couldn't, Mr. Goddard. I, I, I have classes in ten minutes. Sister, it's your job to go down there. Isn't there someone else you can get? Even if there were, you should know better. Letting someone else do your job is a design of the devil. I'll see, Mother Superior. You're right about letting someone else do your job. That was merely a quote. Well, whoever said it, it's very true. It's from the writings of Martin Luther. Oh? From his earlier writings, I imagine. I'll be back in a moment, Mr. Goddard. I've never seen so many pictures in my life. It's so hard to believe these men were once children. Little boys. Nice little boys, too. I'm not so sure how nice they were, even as little boys. They just didn't get the proper training. This one did. It says here that he studied to be a carpenter. Then he murdered somebody with a hammer. Mr. Goddard, I don't think that's the least... Oh! Well? This one. I think that's the man I saw in the alley. Yes, I'm sure it is. George Soderquist, huh? Oh, let me have that card. Sergeant. Find anything? A fellow named Soderquist. Do you know him? No, afraid not. What's his record? Three arrests, armed robbery, one conviction. Last known to be in Gary, Indiana. I'll put a call through to Gary right away. Oh, give him a rundown. And also, uh, tell him I'll bring uh, Sister Augustine as long as an identifying witness. Oh, I'm afraid the church authorities would frown on that, Mr. Goddard. If we can't find Soderquist, I'll... Don't worry, I'll have you back here in no time. I'll have Washington contact your bishop. Meanwhile, Mr. Goddard, I'm returning to my classroom. You do that, sister. I'll pick you up as soon as I get an okay. Good evening. I'm Mother Ambrose. My name's Goddard. I have a letter here from the bishop. So I understand. Sit down, Sister Augustine. Thank you, Mother Ambrose. I've come to Gary at the request of the police department. We've been advised, sister. You'll stay here at St. Michael's Parish House. Thank you. Is this Mr. Uh, a Sodaquist, a friend of your sister? Oh, no, no. I, I picked him out of the mug book. Mug book? It's just a phrase she picked up. Oh. Uh, will you be here long, sister? Until we can prefer charges against Sodaquist for murder. Are you sure he's a murderer, Mr. Goddard? Yes, but he'll get a trial and everything the law allows. But not one drop of charity. Excuse me, please. There's a Lieutenant Goodman from the police. He's been here waiting for you to arrive. You, uh, you don't think very much of me, do you, sister? I feel sorry for you, Mr. Goddard. I don't think you have a heart. 
Well, fortunately, that doesn't seem to matter so much to the people I work for, so why don't you just forget... Right in here, Mr. Goodman. Thank you. Got it? Yeah. I'm Dave Goodman, homicide. Oh, come on in. Uh, This is Sister Augustine. How do you do? How do you do? Well, we've got your boy Soderquist staked out in the downtown pool room. Ah, that's fine. We can't move, though, until the sister here identifies him. Would you like to come down and have a look? But I... Very well, Mr. Goodman. Mother Ambrose, we'll be back shortly. Where will you be if the bishop or someone should inquire? I'll be downtown, Mother Ambrose, at the pool hall. Well, uh, not exactly, sister. Oh? There's a hock shop across the street. I've made arrangements with the proprietor. He has a fine view of the pool room. Pool rooms? Hock shops? Must I go? With any luck, you'll be back here in an hour. Let's go, Goodman. Better take another look across the street, sister. We've got to be certain. But I've told you he's the man. The one wearing the coat. That's Soderquist, all right. Well, whoever he is, he's the man who spoke to me in that alley in La Porte. And now I'll, I'll go back to the parriage house, if you don't mind. Just a minute. That uh, man with him, what about him? I don't know. He, he may be the one who was with him in La Porte, but I, I'm not sure. That pool room's a known hangout for Hoodlum's got it. He may have a record. Yeah, let's find out. Is the tail still on, Soderquist? Sure. Is that all, then? For now, yeah. I'll take you back to St. Michael's. No, no, please. You're going to be busy. I'll just get a taxi down at the corner. It's no trouble at all. Alone? Well, I don't think you should... Good night, gentlemen. Yeah. Earl? Mrs. Vegas. Well? We're in trouble, Earl. Five minutes ago, I'm driving down to meet Soderquist at the pool room. Remember I told you about that nun in La Porte? Well, she's here in Gary, the same nun, and a block away from the pool room. She's here for a reason, Earl. I'll get hold of Soderquist. No, no, keep him undercover. Where'd she go, the nun? I don't know. I was stuck with a traffic light. But I'm going to cut this town open and find her. I'm going to find her, see, before she finds me. You might just as well stay here at headquarters, Goddard. I'll be bringing in Soderquist any minute now. Yeah. Say, uh, you know this town, Goodman. Tell me why a couple of gunsels would knock off Harry Gruber. Well, robbery, say? For dough? <laughs> if you're a government cop, you have to marry money to buy a stick of gum. Why would they go to all that trouble taking his body to Laporte? You know, when a hood kills a man, it's a hood who leaves town. Could be because they wanted to stay here in Gary. It'd be interesting to have Soderquist tell us. Homicide, Goodman. Where? All right, all right. Shake down the district and send some men over to his apartment. I want him in here. You don't have to tell me. He jumped the tail. Any other time, it's a cinch. This time we draw a nearsighted cop. Well, we got to head him off. How tight can you seal this town? Real tight. Okay, lock it up. Without him, we haven't got a lead. We'll have him in here tonight. If you want me, I'll be at the post office. That is, if it hasn't been stolen. <laughs> Well, I can tell you this much, Carter. I've been postmaster here for ten years, and all that time I've never known Harry Gruber to do anything but hit town and make a routine check. But this time you say he suddenly became interested in uh, three of your truck drivers. Well, it? yes. Uh, yes, uh, these are their photographs. Gruber sat here and brooded over those files all one afternoon. I don't know for sure, but I'd guess it had something to do with the transfer of money between the two stations. What two stations? Well, here in Gary, we have two railroad stations. On through shipments, we transfer from one station to the other by mail truck. Big shipments? The one from Cleveland's a Lulu. And uh, one of these three drivers always handles the run between the two stations? Yes. And that's the last question Gruber asked me. He left here, and six hours later, he was dead in La Porte. Oh, I bet he called on this guy first, Paul Farrar. Well, Farrar's one of the three drivers, all right. It says here on his record sheet that uh, he was offered a better job, but he turned it down. Now, why would he turn down a $500 a year raise to keep driving a truck? I think he said he'd like to be out of doors. 500 bucks worth? Uh, he's on duty now. I'll uh, send for him. No, no, no. I just want a quick glimpse. If he's the one I have in mind, that's all I'll need. Uh, he'll be down at the loading platform. This way, got it. You see the registry board over there? Well, that's Farrar carrying the sack. 
This is quite a break, Taylor. I told you that Soderquist was talking to someone in the pool room. Well, that's who he was talking to, Farrar. Look, you better phone Washington. Get a Hearn back in town. And meanwhile, I, I want a list of all your money transfers. Well, there's nothing missing, Goddard. So Gruber wasn't killed because he found Farrar stealing money. Look, a cheat kills his wife for one of two reasons. Either she's caught him cheating or she hasn't given him the chance. Same way with money. You mean Gruber found out about a deal or something between Farrar and Soderquist? Between George Soderquist and somebody else. That's the big one, Taylor. Who is the somebody else? Nala. Regis. Stay where you are, Earl. I'll be there in ten minutes. The nun, you found her, huh? Yeah. A place called St. Michael's School. Well? Not yet, Earl. But I got a way to do it. Sometime early tomorrow morning. <laughs> Continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Take the famous all-Negro basketball team, the Harlem Globetrotters. As unofficial ambassadors, in one year they played ball before more than a million people on four continents. In Rio de Janeiro, they entertained crowds of from 30,000 to 50,000. During one summer, they toured Europe and Africa, chalking up another 600,000 fans. In 1952, they celebrated their 25th anniversary as a team by circling the globe. Yes, sir, the team organized by Abe Saperstein really gets around. And their exhibitions have been more than just a demonstration of American basketball. They've been a lot more. The team is a living example of American fair play and sportsmanship, in and out of uniform. Abe Saperstein now carries a letter which reads in part, The Harlem Globetrotters have proved themselves ambassadors of goodwill. On any future tours, please call on us for any help we can give. And the letter is signed by the United States State Department. In being ambassadors of fair play, the Harlem Globetrotters prove that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Al Goddard, and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine, with Dan Riss as a hern. It's the following morning. The man called Regus has entered a third-rate hotel and gone directly into the manager's office. Well, what about the nun? She got lucky. Makes sense, Regus. They're fixing the roof of the school. Tile. Big hunks of tile. Yeah. So accidentally, a big piece of tile falls down just when she's walking past. And like I said, Earl, she got lucky. Well, I'm glad she did. You get Soderquist? Yeah, he's upstairs. You know, you're making too many mistakes, Riggers. Killing Gruber was a mistake. It happened. Now, forget about the nun. We may never hear from her again. Soderquist will hear plenty from her. There's a police call out for him. Are you sure she can identify him? And what about you? No. But Soderquist could identify me. Well, we've got to get him out of here. Then we'll think about that nun, huh? In case she did something. I said forget about it. I'm still running things. Remember that. Earl, if they ever get me in the back room of police headquarters, I'll remember it fine. <laughs> Come on, Regus. Let's go up and see Joe. Hi, Earl. Regus. <laughs> Sit down, fellas. How about a, a cup of coffee, huh? I got rules in this hotel, George. No hot plates. It's a fire hazard. Huh? Oh. Uh, I fixed the room up pretty good, huh? You got to get out of here, George. You see, you've been identified by that sister. You don't know for sure. You told me you didn't know for sure. We can't afford to take a chance, you know that. So you better go to St. Louis for a while. St. Louis? I don't even know anybody in St. Louis. You're not going there to run for office, you know, George. <laughs> You're going to protect yourself and us. Come on, let's start packing. I'll help you. No, no, I'm not going. I told you I didn't want to go. You know what's coming up. You'll be taken care of. How do I know? Because I say so. Or listen to me. That's the most money I ever heard of. If I'm dealt out now, I don't have a prayer. Start packing, George. I'm not going. I'm staying here until I... Regis, no, no. What did I ever do to you? And uh, 
this is Mr. Ahern. Sister Augustine, Mother Ambrose. Mother Ambrose. Do do? You see, uh, Mr. Ahern is just as much interested in that accident this morning as I am. That uh, piece of tile, sister, it fell without any warning at all? One of the workmen must have left it too near the edge of the roof. Well, while we're looking for Soderquist, you might be able to help us with the other man in the alley. I'd like you to go through that rogues gallery again. No, 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 that's a waste of time. Sister, I want you to go back to Fort Wayne. Well, why the switch, Al? I thought we well, were... Well, it's a matter of common sense. Sister, while you're here in Gary, we're responsible for anything that happens to you, like this accident. Oh, there's no need to worry about me, Mr. Goddard. I have a guardian angel. You have a what? A guardian angel. It's a new idea to Mr. Goddard, sister. Look, Maury, I've got nothing against angels. I, I just want her to get back to Fort Wayne before she gets hurt. You told me once not to let anyone else do my job. It's my duty to stay, and I'm staying. All right, stay. Oh, there's the dinner bell. I'm afraid you must excuse us, gentlemen. And don't worry, Mr. Goddard. I'll be all right. What would happen, Maury, if we put the screws to Farrar? Oh, you'd blow the whole thing, so don't try anything fancy just because you're worried about that nun. I'm not worried about her. I, I just want to find some quick way to shake up Farrar and to find Soda Forget Quiz and... the quick ways. You just stick to straight police work. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, by the way, Al. Yeah? The nun. What's her pitch? Farrar, you want to play pool, or would you rather talk? Get going, Mac. Me? I'd sooner talk. Oh, you're real friendly, huh? You don't know me. Paul Farrar, P.O. Serial number 20754. Are you a cop? Postal inspector, Al Goddard. I followed you here. Oh, I see. Now, there's a nice, quiet little table in the corner. Let's sit down, huh? What do you... You got some questions or something? Yeah, a few. How would you like to go to prison for the murder of Harry Gruber? What's the matter with you? You're crazy? I don't even know any Harry Gruber. I believe you. But I can rig it so a jury won't. I can break every alibi you've got, and I can prove that you know George Soderquist. That you were with him the night that Gruber was killed. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's very simple, Farrar. I'm going to railroad you for Gruber's murder. Why? Why go out and just pick a guy up out of thin air? What's the point? The point is that I'll forget the whole thing if I can get the right price. $25,000. Oh, this is just a nice little shakedown, huh? Well, it's my welfare work. I wouldn't want to see you go to prison. Now, where would I get $25,000? Your friends. And you can tell them that I know why you turned down that $500 raise. That doesn't mean a thing. You can also tell them that I know why you drive that mail truck. Because if you don't, all their plans for that robbery go right out the window. Look, I don't believe any of this. Not about Soderquist or the robbery or this, this shakedown. I don't even believe you're a cop. Then check around. Meanwhile, I'm at the Park Hotel. Talk to your friends, Farrar. And get that money. If you don't, I'm going to frame you and wreck every chance they ever had to pull that robbery. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait. Why are you doing this? I told you. For $25,000. And I want that money by midnight or I catch the late train for Washington. <laughs> Yes? It's me, Farrar. Well? Well, there's no such thing as $25,000. Okay, beat it. You mean you'd still frame me? Sure I would. Uh, look, look, I know some of the men that Soderquist knows, and I've talked to them. But they haven't got that kind of money, and I'm not in whatever they're doing. Oh, sure, but sure. But I'll go along with you in any way I can. Is that why you're here? Well, they want to meet you. They say they'll try to work out something. I, I think they're scared. Yeah, scared to death. Well? Look, I don't want to talk to any third parties. There'll be no tape recordings and no tricks. I'm going to talk to you and you alone. But as far as I'm concerned, the talk's finished. Now, look, give me a break, will you? I haven't anything to do with this. I don't believe a word you've said. Except there isn't any that kind of money. Okay. I'll buy my racing stable some other time. Meanwhile, I'll concentrate on being a hero. Will you listen to me? It's not my fault. Forget the deadline. You've mapped it. I'm the one that's going to go to prison. What can I do? That's your problem. You still going to take that train to Washington? Well, sure. Yeah, why not? Get going, Farrar. Get out of here. Yes? This is Goddard. I just thought I'd call you, Maury. I've checked out of the hotel, and I'm counting on somebody to beat my brains out in about 30 minutes. Al, what are you trying to tell me? Well, it's one of those quick plans, the kind you don't approve of. 
but I got a pretty fair chance of finding out who killed Harry Gruber. They've got plenty of reasons now to want me. Oh, I've told you a dozen times not to try... Where are you? I'll be right over. Sorry, Maury, but I'm on my way. Well, you're waking up, huh, Mr. Goddard? How do you feel? Oh, oh great. You better keep the ice bag. It'll keep the swelling down. I'm some nursey, huh? Do you mind telling me just where I am? Oh, sure. Fourth floor, Compton Hotel. Your friends are waiting for you. Oh, fine. They were real glad to see me. They met me at the railroad station. Now, who are you, honey? Me? Hotel stenographer. Drafted for the emergency. I think he feels like talking, Earl. Get lost, Dottie. Sure, honey, sure. Get lost. Remember us? Yeah, vaguely. But there were more than two of you, though. You never should have tried to run, pal. Those lumps must be real painful. Skip it, Riggers. You know who I am? Yeah, sure. Post office inspector. You're not silly enough to think you might get away with this. We can try. Like Gruber? We don't know Gruber. It won't help to put me in concrete. There's too much interest left around. You, um, you look like a pretty smart guy. What are you hanging around with a gun off like this for? Anybody ever weigh your head? I'm talking to him. I got two years of work tied up in this robbery, got it? I'm all set to go. I'm not going to give it up now. Well, what else can you do? Well, that's just it. Farrar tells me you want $25,000 to keep quiet. That was hours ago. How do we know you're not a plant? You don't. But I know what Gruber knew. With Farrar in your pocket, you've got a real big one on tap. There's a law against robbing the mails, but there's nothing that says you can't talk about it. We're kidding, naturally. Oh, sure. Well, we haven't got 25000 But uh, there's close to a million in this idea we're working on. We could cut you in. Why don't you wake up? You can't beat the mails. they got a system. So have we. With your help, we can make it foolproof. That's why you're still alive. No, thanks. You know, you're the one who's on the spot, got it, not us. Sure, we'd have to fold, but if we do, you won't be around to know the difference. So, think it over. You, uh, keeping me here? That's right. I'm due back at work in the morning. They'll start checking. You can skip a day. It'll look funny. Look, get this straight, God, until you prove out you're going nowhere. Nowhere we don't want you to. There's nothing to prove out. I'm a postal inspector, like Gruber was. I came across something that looked phony, just like he did. Only I see it a little differently than Gruber. You can buy me out. We could also kid you. And kiss off a million-dollar haul? <laughs> now your friend here knows better. Like he said, with my help, it's foolproof. You know, I don't get it. You go along one way for years, and then you pull a complete switch. Why? Well, sooner or later, every rooster wants to lay an egg. Any special reason you want 25 grand? Yeah, the same reasons that you'd like a million. Only I'm not as greedy as you are. Look, I told you before, we haven't got it. If you want to cut of the robbery, okay. If you don't, get out. If I walk out of here, your robbery goes out the window. And you go on running this two-bit hotel. For the next ten years, you'll be changing sheets and putting drunks to bed. So don't get so tough. Are you in or out? I'm in. Now, you run your end any way you want, but I take full charge of the post office. No? What's wrong with Farrar? Look, someone else will pick up Farrar the same way I did. If I'm going to risk my neck, I'll do it my way. And one other thing. we got to make it look good downtown. i got to be free to move around on my job as usual. Okay. You sure we're giving him enough? What does that mean, Rigas? We're giving him his own way in a cut. Why don't we all just give him a right arm for old time's sake? You know, sometimes you worry me, Rigas. Somewhere in your blood, you got a crazy bug, and it's swimming upstream night and day. You better get a cure, or you'll kill us all. All right, Earl, all right. We'll let it stand this way. But you got it. One bad move out of you, and I'll put you on your back for good. That's for tonight in the station, okay? All square and even? Tough guy, huh, Earl? Real tough guy. I just don't like to be shoved around. Okay, Earl, now that I'm in, how about giving me some of the details? But where are you, Al? Where are you phoning from? Drugstore near the Compton Hotel, my new address. You all right, huh? Yeah, I'm all right. Now listen, Maury. 
We were right about the robbery. It's a million-dollar reserve stick-up. How'd you find out about it? Well, one thing led to another, and I agreed to help them. Help them? You know what you're saying. Now, don't worry. I'm not going through with the robbery. Now, look, get a rundown on these two names. Earl Bedecker and Joe Regus. How long before the robbery? Oh, well, maybe ten days. Enough time to shop on Gruber and get out with my skin. Now, if we could only tie in Soderquist, we'd have... I'll call you back. Hello. Hi. Remember me? Ah, yes, my favorite nurse. What are you doing out? Can't you phone from the hotel? Can't you? Oh, I don't want to use the phone. I'm just buying some new records. You like Bob? I think I'm starting to. I think I'm starting to. Well, I got some new ones here. Come on back to the hotel. I got a record player up in my room. Oh, I'd like that fine, Dodie. But uh, what about Earl? Will he be there, too? Earl don't ever have to worry about me. <laughs> but what about me? You think Earl has to worry about me? That's something I wonder about. Come in, Mr. Goddard? Or do you have to make another phone call? I'm fresh out of dimes, honey. Let's go. Act three of the Hollywood Radio Theater will continue in just a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In 1864, Clara Barton gave up a successful job in the patent office in Washington and devoted the rest of her life to bringing physical and mental aid to the wounded and dying on the battlefield. At first, it was the soldiers of the American Civil War. But when the war ended, she was forced to go abroad to recuperate from nervous exhaustion. While she was in Switzerland, Napoleon declared war on Prussia. Clara Barton was urged to return to her own country, but she refused. She felt it was her duty to remain in Europe and help the wounded of this new war. It didn't make any difference to her if they were French or Prussian. She didn't ask the nationality of the sufferer when she stopped the flow of blood from a soldier's wound. In spite of many inconveniences and hardships, she traveled across the rugged German countryside to reach the Prussian front line. But there she was told that the only way she could be allowed into a frontline camp would be as a prisoner of war. Clara Barton agreed, and as a prisoner until the end of the war, she continued to do her work with the wounded Prussian soldiers. After the war, she remained in Europe to help the defeated French. When she sailed for home in 1873, grateful Europeans bestowed on her many medals of honor, including the Gold Cross of Remembrance, the Jewel of the Red Cross, and the Iron Cross of Merit. Once again, an unselfish American had discovered that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification. Three of Appointment with Danger, starring William Holden as Al Goddard and Colleen Gray as Sister Augustine, with Dan Riss as Ahern. It's the following morning, and Al Goddard is once again in the visitor's room at St. Michael's School, this time with a snapshot for Sister Augustine. I won't approve of my methods in getting this picture, sister. I stole it from a girlfriend of a gentleman named Earl Bedecker. But I doubt if she'll miss it. Why, it's a picture of Mr. Soderquist. That's right. Soderquist and friends. And I think one of these other men was with him that night in the alley. Now, this one. His name is Joe Regas. I'm sorry, Mr. Goddard, but I... I just can't be certain. Oh, okay. Is there anything else? Yes, I, um, I told you to stay indoors because you're in danger. And where did I find you? Out in the playground with a bunch of kids. Now, you won't frighten me away from those children. Here, this is for you. A revolver? Mr. Goddard, please. Now, put it away at once. It'll protect you. Uh, take it as a, as a personal favor. 
I didn't know you could afford personal feelings. All right, it's it's not personal. It's routine. You know, with a little practice, you could be quite a nice man. Now put that gun back in your pocket, and I'll show you through the back way. It may be safer for you. You're learning fast, sister. I think the government expects a lot from young men. Well, it's my job. I have to take the risk. Well, they should get some of those politicians to do it. When I'm in trouble, sister, I'll quote you. Now, uh, you be careful. I will. But remember, I have that guardian angel. I've got one, too. It's in my pocket. Only mine never misses. Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. You sure you know what you're doing, Al, coming here to the post office? Part of my deal with Bedeker is to keep acting like a cop. Relax, it's okay. Well, what's this big news you mentioned on the phone? Bedeker's changed his mind. He's moved the date up. They've set the robbery for tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow was going to be a week from tomorrow. If he suspects anything, we I can't figure out whether he does or not. Well, there's one thing for sure. He's set on tomorrow, and I can't stall it. And he's found the perfect flaw. The reserve shipment from Cleveland to Logansport. A flaw? Yeah. There's no through train from Cleveland to Logansport. The money's transferred from one train to the other right here in Gary. Yes, but it's protected all the way by armored trucks and machine guns. All except that seven minutes here in Gary. It travels from one station to the other in a single mail truck. One man and a forty-five pistol. It's a great scheme. So you had to tackle the whole thing by yourself? Well, this time I did. Because you got soft-hearted about a nun? Look, she's our star witness to Gruber's murder. We've got to protect her. All right, you've got a badge. Why don't you arrest me for perjury? How can I? It's the first time I've ever liked you. Look, look, we've got to find Soderquist. We have found him. You what? Soderquist is dead. Murdered. Goodman's men found the body early this morning in the canal. You boys keeping secrets or something? Oh, now, take it easy, Take Al. it easy. The Gruber case blows up in our faces. Look, I had to wait till I talked to Washington. Oh, fine, yeah. Now I suppose they want us to go ahead with the robbery. We've got nothing this way that would last five minutes in court. We'd get them on a charge like that, and one of them will break on Gruber. Well, can you think of any other way? <sighs> okay, I'll go on back to the hotel. Just bail out in time, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure, I hear you. Hello? Maury Goddard. I just got back to the hotel and the desk said you'd been calling me. Where are you? I'm in a booth around the corner. I've put you in a bad hole, Al. Right after you left my office, one of the guards found Farrar. He was hiding. Farrar? Just outside my office. He's sure to have heard everything we were talking about. But he slugged the guard and got away. You haven't seen him yet, have you? No, not yet. But let him alone. Don't even look for him. He's bound to get to Bedeker and tell him, so pull out now and run. Don't walk. Uh, I got some things up in my room. I'll get them and meet you in 20 minutes. Well, we've been waiting for you, Al. How you doing, Inspector? What's wrong? Why? Who says anything's wrong? Nobody, but I opened my door and find you here, so... We've been waiting for you, that's all. Now, let's get moving. Where? What's this all about? Just a final check of the plans. We're driving out to the shack. Cronin and Connor will meet us out there. Now? Now, pal, now. Well, you've got a face a foot long. You just lose your best friend. I'm my best friend. That's what he means. Come on, let's get started. Now, what about the two sedans, Cronin? Yeah, we borrow them out of that parking lot. I've been casing them every day for a month. You got no worry. All right, let's look at the map again. Now, at the end of four minutes, the mail truck will be right here. That's point A. We've been through this a hundred times. We'll go through it again. It's what happens after we grab the door that bothers me. It's simple. We turn west off the boulevard to point B. We switch the cars and then we... Sit down, got it. Sit down. Earl will answer it. Hello. All right, Dottie, what is it? I don't want him out here. You what? Okay, thanks. Farrar called Doty. Anything happen? I don't know. Farrar's coming here? Yeah, that's right. He's on his way. I told him to stay away from us. All of us. Hey, you're jumping all over the place, Al. Settle down. It can't matter that much. Well, if he's followed, it could matter a million dollars worth. Farrar knows what he's doing. Now, let's get back to the map. Now, after point B, these three cross streets have got to be blocked off. That's Regis' job. Roadblocks... Detour signs. If anybody sees us, we're dead. Remember that, Regis. The whole job depends on not being recognized. If anybody slips, it won't be me. 
What about Pal here? Got her. I'll be at the mail truck. Among other things, there's a little matter of making sure we grab the right pouch. Now, what about point C, Earl? There's a million dollars waiting for us. But if we're seen, we'll be running for the rest of our lives. Okay, about back here at the shack. We'll make another switch of the cars, and then we'll be... Oh, Earl, I gotta talk to you. I... I... Well, put down the gun, Cotted. What are you doing here, Ferrar? Well, it's a... about tomorrow, Earl. I, I gotta make sure I... I... Hey, what's he gotta go point a gun at me for? Maybe we ought to rent you a memory. Earl told you to keep away. After this thing happens, the town's gonna be flooded with federal men. We're all going to be in a spot, so the first guy who talks is going to get a headache he can't cure. You understand, Farrar? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything else, Earl? No, let's break this up. I'll drive back to town with Farrar. But why can't... You heard him. The next time you want to see me, phone the hotel. Let's go, Farrar. I don't trust him, Earl. That punk Farrar. He's scared he'll do what he's told. Like Soderquist? Soderquist was scared, too. No more of that stuff. I've had enough of it. Look, our luck's gone bad, Earl. It went bad that night in the alley. Stop thinking about that nun. You want to know why I think about her? Because I'm hot and you're not. And sometime years from now, maybe when the rest of you are all scattered, somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder. That's why I think about her. Yeah, but you're clear. Soderquist is dead and you say she never even saw you. Yeah. And sometimes I believe that. Sometimes for as long as two or three minutes... Just watch how and where you drive, Farrar. There's a gun on your ribs. You behave yourself, you keep away, and you might get off with five to ten years. Five to ten? Oh, thanks. That's sure going to help with my love life. It's more romantic than being dead. Now, drop me off at the hotel. <laughs> No, thanks, Jody. Uh, can we turn off that music for a minute? Huh? Yeah, sure. Earl come back yet? Uh-uh. Unless he's downstairs. Jody, uh, what did Farrar want when he called you? Well, all he said was he had to talk to Earl. He sounded real nervous. What did he lose, an airmail stamp? You know, Jody, I'd give an awful lot to know what goes on behind that makeup. For instance. Does, uh... You afraid of me, Earl? Does Earl ever get jealous? He understands. You can put strings on good women or bad women. But you can't do anything about the lazy ones. You can beat them. They stay about the same. Can't make them do the right thing or the wrong thing. They're lazy. They do the easy thing. And if uh, Earl found me here with you now, alone? I don't know. But it sounds real exciting. A little too exciting, honey. Oh, uh, if Earl asks for me... Yeah? Tell him I'm at the post office making a final check. It looks like we're set, Al. Goodman's bringing his boys here tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. And that'll give you over an hour. Okay. Now, just tell him to be careful. I'll be riding in the hold-up car. And don't close in until we're all back at that shack. Now, what about Farrar? Goodman's tailing him. He'll pick him up at noon tomorrow. He'll be safer in jail. I'll keep him there. Bettiger doesn't want him around either until it's all over. Where do you go now, Al? I'll back to the hotel by way of St. Michael's School. So I'm to go back to Fort Wayne. Is that it, Mr. Goddard? That's right, sister. A police matron will stop by tomorrow afternoon and go with you. There's nothing else that I can do? Well, with Sodaquist dead, I'm afraid you're out of it. I haven't been of much help, have I? Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. I'll remember you in my prayers. Thank you, sister. If you haven't anything else, at least uh, now I've got a good lawyer. Now we better start. It's almost five o'clock. Anything from you, Al? No. Now, look. Just don't get gun happy. You can rob Fort Knox and live, but steal a dime and kill a post office clerk, and they'll spend the rest of their lives running you down. All right, start moving, Cronin. 
Now, there's one other thing, but I'll tell you later in the car. We're changing point C. Right. What do you mean you're changing point C? Sounds simple, pal. We're changing it. I found out just a couple of hours ago. Found out what? There's a better road to the shack. There's less traffic. So we're changing point C. Is there any reason why we shouldn't? No. No, I guess not. You're not driving, so don't let it worry you. Now, where's your coat? In my room. Well, get it. Then go out through the lobby and meet me in the back. Inspector's office, Ahern. I'm phoning from my room, Maury, but uh, there's no time, so don't ask questions. Go ahead. They've just changed point C. I don't know the new location. That means you'll have to watch all the roads in case there's a slip-up. If there isn't, they'll wind up as scheduled at the shack. Now, I won't have a chance to... I'd say you pulled a boner, Al. I'd say so, too, Dodie. I heard what you just said on the phone. It might help if I hadn't been with Earl for so long. You're going to tell him? If I told him, he'd have to kill you. Better make me, what do they call it, accessory or something? And you don't love anybody that much. Not 25 years worth. I'm a loser either way. Suppose they get away with all that dough this afternoon. Be wearing mink coats and high dodge and hamburger joints. Living on the run till they catch up with Earl. Well, at least you read the book. What are you going to do, Dodie? When you walk out, I'm going to pack my bag and leave. I'm going to forget names and faces and what's going to happen to all of you in the next hour or so. They can still get you for withholding information. Not if I tell a government agent. So I'm telling you, they're going to hold up a mail truck. I got a pack, so goodbye. You uh, won't get a gold star, but thanks anyway. Don't bother. Earl was good to me. I hope he kills you. <laughs> Calling car 73. Calling Inspector Ahern. This is Goodman calling car 73. Come in, Goodman. They pulled the job. Everything is scheduled except Regus. Regus? What about him? We followed his car from 4th Street. He's gone to the railroad station. He could be skipping town by train, but it doesn't make sense. Forget Regus. Stick to your schedule. All right. See you later at the shack. Afternoon, sister. Good afternoon. I'm from the police department. We'd like to talk to you. But... I-, I thought I was to go back to Fort Wayne. Yeah, sure, later. Well, if you think you need me. Oh, the matron. She's getting our tickets. I'd better go and tell her. Oh, look, her. there isn't any time. My partner will tell her this way, sister. My car's just outside. Where's Regas, Earl? Why isn't he here? I don't know, and I don't like it. He'll wait five minutes if he doesn't show up. What is this place, anyway? I told you, the new point C. It used to be a quarry or something. Earl, he's coming. Regus. All right, get him over here. You and Gunner stole the money in back of his car. Hey, he's heading for the shed. He's got someone in the car with him. What's he talking about? What shed? There's an old tool shed back there. Come on, Gunner. We're wasting time. Come on in, boys. Take a look. I found her, see? The nun. What's he talking about? An old friend, Al. An old friend of Regus from Laporte. She's been to the police. She told me. And she got a little noisy, Earl, so I stuffed her mouth. Uh, what else did she tell you? Nothing yet. But now that we're all here, she's going to tell plenty. You're crazy, Regus. Do you want us to Stop get off? Stop arguing. We haven't got time. How about it, Earl? Okay? I, uh... I don't know. She knows about the robbery. She's seen us, all of us. Killing her isn't going to do any good. Besides, who'd touch her? She's a nun. Regus could do it. Real quick, pal. Now, what harm can she do us? She doesn't know our names or anything about us. If we're caught, she can identify us. If we're caught, we're through anyway. Look, you're here on a free ride, Goddard. Don't come to the party and give away drinks. Take her gag off, Regis. I said take the gag off. Yeah, sure. Now listen to me, sister. We'll take your word. You've never seen us. You can't identify us. We'll take your word. Thank you. I couldn't give you my word about a thing like that. What difference does it make? A great deal. I couldn't let my silence be used as a weapon against the law. But you're not hired to defend the law. I'm sorry. I cannot give you my word. All right, Regus. Take her out back somewhere. Come on, lady. Leave her alone. Lie down, Rover. You need a new mouth, Regus. Please, please don't. Please, please, somebody stop the fight. Uh, come on, we'll break it up. we got to get out of here. For this, we got time, maybe. With a million dollars to split, just pray for a tie. Mr. Goddard, he's got a gun! I had to do it, Earl. 
Rodriguez or me? Yeah. Well, what are you waiting for? If those shots were heard, we're, we're going to be in trouble. You're already in trouble, Mr. Goddard. Now drop the gun. The sister knows you, huh? Well, you picked a talky partner. How far's it gone? It's a fix all the way. The whole area staked out for miles around. Only we got you and we got her. Leave her here. I'll see that you get through the police. No, thanks. You don't have a chance, Earl. Leave her alone. I promise to get you through. For what? To grab 20 minutes of air and die on a back road somewhere? Right now, 20 minutes is a lot of time. All right, get out to the car. Sister, you're either lucky or living right. You drive, Gunner. That's just a warning, Medicare. We've got you surrounded. Put your hands up and start walking. Get around to the back. There's a path through the woods. Not the money. We got a million bucks in the car. We'll give you five seconds. We got nothing. Better. You heard what he said. It's a fist all the way. The dough's phony. Come on. Hell, look, they're closing in. They're back there, too. Then shut up and start shooting. <laughs> Taking you to a hospital. But if you got anything to say, you better say it now. I, I'm gonna die. Huh? You asked for it, Bettinger. Yeah. Sure. Well, where's Goddard? I'm here, Earl. It's too bad. I'd walk over, but I can't. My leg. Your aim was a little low. Just tell me one thing, will you? For the record, Al. Was the dough phony, too? No, it was real. You'll die rich, Earl. Take it easy, Al. Uh, did you get them all? We got them. Mr. Goddard. It's all right, sister. I'll make it. Now, uh, you did fine. Are you sure you're not hurt? No. When the shooting started, I just threw myself down on the floor. That's what the boys do at school when they play those terrible games. <laughs> Maury, get her on that train, will you? I... I think she wants to get back to those kids. I've got a car waiting any time you're ready, sister. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Goddard. God bless you. Well, for once you were right, Maury. Somebody who doesn't have a pitch. Al, if you stay with it and work real hard, one of these days you're going to qualify for the human race. <laughs> Thanks. I may join at that. In a moment, our stars will return. The occupation of the Japanese city of Yokosuka is a good example of democracy at work. The first thing our troops had to do was clean up their own area. But then they looked at the devastation, the sickness, and the low morale of the people around them, and they set to work. To create better living conditions, they demolished rotten, rat-infested buildings. They converted unused buildings into schoolrooms, gymnasiums, and chapels. And with their own funds, they furnished much of the equipment. For health, they covered the city, giving anti-tuberculosis shots, typhoid inoculations, x-ray pictures, and smallpox vaccinations. To raise the spirits of the people, they started boys' clubs, women's clubs, Red Cross groups. The occupation is over now, but the Japanese have had a taste of democracy. They like it. They've seen it work. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. William Holden and Colleen Gray, please come forward for a curtain call. Bill, have you ever had a real appointment with danger? Well, Irving, I tried to walk across Hollywood Boulevard again this afternoon. <laughs> Don't let him kid you, Irving. A few months ago, Bill made a trip to Japan and Korea to entertain our troops. He went to the front lines and hospitals and talked to the boys. Well, it was a real privilege to meet them. I hope to go back soon. How about you, Colleen? Have you had any dangerous appointments lately? Well, I've been vanquished. Vanquished? How awful. No, Irving. The Vanquished is the name of my latest picture for Paramount, co-starring John Payne and Jan Sterling. 
It's packed with danger and excitement. Now, really, Colleen, if, if you want to plug your picture, why don't you just come out and say it like I do? All right, so go ahead. Starlog 17. Hey, Bill, watch your language. <laughs> you, <laughs> you remember Starlog 17, Colleen? It was one of the funniest plays on Broadway, and it's Bill's latest for Paramount. <laughs> of course. Now, tell me, what's the latest, Irving? A beautiful love story with a perfect setting. The romantic countryside of Italy. It's Paramount Pictures' moving and sensitive drama of September Affair. And starring in their original roles in this unforgettable romance will be Joan Fontaine and Joseph Cotton. Well, we'll be looking forward to that one, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night. And you have a most pleasure to return to... by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter in I Confess. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, I Confess, has one of the most unusual plots for sustained interest and suspense I have ever seen. And of course, when that master director, Alfred Hitchcock, adds his individual touch to the action, it's bound to be another screen hit for Warner Brothers. And for our stars, we have one of the finest actresses on the screen, Phyllis Thaxter, co-starring with Cary Grant, who will again prove his great versatility in a highly dramatic role. You know, there's no soap quite like mild and gentle Lux. Lux toilet soap has been a Hollywood custom for years. Once our glamorous Hollywood stars start using Lux, they won't use any other soap. And once you start using it, you'll know why nine out of ten screen stars depend on Lux soap for their complexion care. Now I confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. night, the venerable city of Quebec. In the moonlight, the narrow cobble side streets are all but deserted. A man, wearing the cassock of a priest, has darted into the rectory of a church. He sheds the cassock, and now he enters the church itself. Who is it? Who's there? It's Father Logan. Oh, Father Logan. I did not recognize you in the dark. Is that you, Keller? Yes, Father. What are you doing here this time of night? I... I came in to pray. Is something wrong? Can I help you? No one can help me. I have abused your kindness. How? You who gave my wife and me a home here, right with the church, a job, even friendship, to me a refugee, a German. Now you will hate me. No, no, I don't hate anyone, Keller. You will, you will hate me. But it was for her, for my wife. She worked so hard, Father. It breaks my heart. Keller, what is it? I must confess to you. I want to make a confession. All right, we'll go to the confession. Yes, yes. I want you to hear my confession. So, you've been to the house of Mr. Villette. Go on, Keller. Yes, Villette, the lawyer. I killed Mr. Villette. Keller. I went to steal his money. I wore a cassock. If anyone saw me, they would think I was a priest. I was looking for the money when Villette surprised me. I did not mean to kill him. You must believe me, Father. I did not mean to kill him. <laughs> No, you 
didn't do it. Otto, you did not kill him. I have just come from confession. Oh. Father Logan is my priest. You are my wife. It is right that you should also know. But why, Otto? Why? I am not a murderer. It was an accident. It was the money. How could I watch you work so hard? I lie awake night after night, and I think all we need is $2,000, Alma. With $2,000, we can start a new life. And Villette was rich. Oh, oh, it's so dangerous. They will catch me. They will hang me. I cannot. I cannot. Father Logan will go to them. He will tell them. He will tell them? No, he cannot tell them what he heard in confession. The police will come. Why, Alma? Why should they come? I have told them nothing, have I? Alma, no one knows. Father Logan knows. But he cannot tell them what he heard in the confessional. Can't you understand that? What are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing at all. In the morning, you are going to the police? Tomorrow is Wednesday, Alma. Isn't that the day when I attend to Mr. Villette's garden? But he is dead. I always work in Mr. Villette's garden on Wednesdays. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Now go to bed. You need to rest. Rest, Alma. Rest. Can I help you, Father? We're trying to keep this crowd away from the house. You are the police? Yes. You've heard, haven't you, Mr. Vallette's been murdered? Yes, I had an appointment here this morning. With Vallette? Yes, his, uh... Is there anything I can do? Well, if you had an appointment, you better go in the house. Uh, do you mind? Not at all. Inspector LaRue's in there. Maybe he'd like to talk to you. This way. Father Michael Logan, huh? What church, Father? The Church of Saint Marie, Inspector. Well, how are Father Millet and Father Benoit? They're both very well, thank you. Good. So you had an appointment with Vallette? Yes. Anything special? No, there was something he... You've heard what's happened, of course, Father. Uh, We've got Keller in the next room. Keller? He works at the rectory, doesn't he? Uh, Yes, he and his wife work there. Poor devil's terrified. I've been waiting for him to settle down. I see. It was Keller who found the body. You don't mind if we call on you later. No, I'll be at the church. Maybe that we'd like to know what your appointment was all about, eh? Well, I'd better see Keller now. Yes, well, goodbye, Inspector. All right, Murphy, bring him in, will you please? But I have told policemen. I have told them everything. Now, there's no need to be frightened, Keller. Now, how did you find the body? This morning, I arrived as usual at half past eight. I came inside. You have a key to this house? No, the door was open. It frightened me. An open door? Why? The door was always locked. I went in and there he was. I could see that he was dead. I wanted to run. Run? You do not understand. How can you? There I was, a man without a country, alone, discovering a murder. I thought of the police. I am always afraid of the police. This is a German fear, this fear. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Yes, Thank you, sir. Father Logan is here. I heard them say that Father Logan... Well, he was here. He's gone now. What will he think of me? Probably very highly, if you can be of more help to us. Help? There are a few things I'd like to know. Now, when you first came into the house, did you call for Mr. Vallette or... Father Logan. Please, we can't talk here. But is it true? It's true, Ruth. Vallette's been murdered. I can't believe it. Michael, we're free. We're free. Are we? Goodbye, Ruth. Father Logan? Come in, Keller. The police, they sent me home. I must talk to you, Father. Why? Why did you come to Villette's house? I know what you must think of me, but I can't give myself up. They would hang me. Has not God forgiven me, thanks to you? But the police never would. I don't know what you're talking about. I confess to you. It was my confession. You must tell me what to do. There... There's nothing I can add to what I've already said. Uh, You are so good, Father. It's easy for you to be good. Have you no pity for me? Otto? Alma? Father Benoit, he asks, will you please mend the tire on his bicycle? 
Yes, yes, right away. The front tire, you left it at the back door. Please, Father. You, you'd better go now and fix the tire. That's about it, Mr. Robertson. I said to myself, you're in no position to go to the Crown Prosecutor. You've got nothing to give him. But I'm here just the same, Mr. Robertson. Oh, you're quite a man, Inspector. Quite a man. Now, we know that Vallette was murdered, strangled, and that robbery may have been the motive. But we're not certain. And no fingerprints and no suspects. Oh, this should be very simple for you, LaRue. I uh, took the liberty of bringing a girl along. A girl? School girl. Oh. Murphy's got her out there in the hall. Just a possibility, Mr. Robertson. All right, LaRue. Let's hear what she's got to say. Thank you, sir. So, you are Augustine. Yes, monsieur. Sorry you had to be dragged out from school, young lady. Oh, but I like to be dragged out from school, monsieur. Well, this is Mr. Robertson. He's the Crown Prosecutor. Now, your mother called to say that you passed the Vallette house last night. That's right. And what time was that? Eleven o'clock, a little after eleven. I was babysitting for M Madame Germain, and I left her house at eleven o'clock. Well, uh, shall we say the time was between eleven and eleven-thirty? Yes, and I saw someone leaving Monsieur Villette's house. A man. A priest, monsieur. What? A priest. Augustine, this is very important. Are you sure? Quite sure, monsieur. I was walking by the Rue Valentin, and then suddenly there was this priest. He was coming out of the house and walking away. Did you see his face? No. How tall was he? Well, like, like you, monsieur. And was he fat or thin? Not fat. But not thin, either. Did you notice anything special about him? Anything at all? No. Did he see you, Augustine? I don't think so, monsieur. But you are absolutely sure he was a priest? Yes. Thank you. You may go now. Oh, uh, I must ask you a favor. I don't want you to say anything to anyone about this. Promise? Oh, yes, monsieur. Goodbye. Goodbye, little one. And if you should need me again... Yes? It would be very nice if you could drag me out of school. <laughs> You know what this means. We'll have to check every rectory in town, find out which priests were out late last night. Uh, it's ridiculous to think a priest would be involved. LaRue, you don't really think it could be a priest? Yes, maybe. There was a priest this morning who... Well? Nothing. I'll have to check further. Well, don't be so mysterious. Well, I should know something more by tomorrow. Good day, Mr. Robertson, and thank you. Inspector. Evening, Keller. Father Logan, do you suppose I could see him? Father Logan? Mm. Oh, sit down, please. I'll see if I can find him. Thank you. Who was it, Otto? Who at the door? A man. A man oh. to see Father Logan. They drove away in the man's car. Oh. Alma, have you washed the cassock? N not yet. Where is it? Upstairs in our room. Do not wash it. I do not want it washed. But why? Listen to me. There is something you must never forget. When I... I suppose we might have had this little talk at the rectory, Father. Hope you don't mind coming here to my office. Not at all. As long as Father Millet knows where I am. You told him? Yes. Unpleasant bit of business, isn't it, Father? If there's anything I can do... Well, I... just a few questions. Now, how long have you been at St. Marie's? Nearly three years. <laughs> you know, I guess I've known Father Millet for 25 years. I was a choir boy when he was over at the Basilica. Yes, he told me tonight what a fine voice you have. <laughs> He's just forgotten, that's all. I uh, hear you were in the Army. Yes. Got the military cross, hmm? Yes. You seem to have done a number of brave things. Well, I survived. Are you given to understatement, Father? Well, that depends. Now, this case, this Vallette murder, it's all understatement so far. You knew Vallette, right? Yes, slightly. Well, then maybe you can help me. What was he like, Father? Oh, I didn't know him well. Well, did you know him socially or in a business sort of way? Actually, neither. I met him once many years ago. Mm. Cigarette? Uh, thank you, no. 
It's a funny thing. No one seems to have known this Villette, really known him. Yet he was a lawyer, had clients. Not one of them has any information that means anything. May I ask what you were going to see him about yesterday morning? Well, that, uh, that was a personal matter. Well, were you acting for someone, Father? One of your parishioners, perhaps? Uh, uh, I can only tell you that my visit had nothing to do with Villette's death. Oh, of course it didn't. But you do understand, don't you, that I must consider every scrap of information. Yes. When a crime's been committed, each scrap of information is important to us. Of course. I know sometimes it seems like, well, like prying. It can be very embarrassing. Oh, I'm not embarrassed, Inspector. Good. Well, I've been wondering about that lady you met outside Vallette's house. She was in that crowd out there. I just happened to glance out the window when I saw you talking to her. Inspector, the appointment I had with Vallette could not be of any importance to you. Oh, but we're not discussing that at the moment, Father. You see, with a murder, one has to jump from one detail to another. Forgive me, I guess I jumped too abruptly for you. <laughs> well, perhaps I just don't follow as fast as you jump. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, I have a methodical mind. I have to take things one by one. Well, about this lady you met out there on the sidewalk. I wish I could discuss it, but I can't. May I ask who she is? She isn't involved. Excuse me, Father, but that's something for me to I decide. I know, I know. But you'll have to take my word for it. She's not involved. Your word. I respect your word, but I need help. I'm not able to help. I see. I just don't want all this mystification to make things too awkward for you, Father. Awkward for me? A priest was seen leaving Vallette's house at the time of the murder. I saw a priest outside Vallette's house the next morning. Well, Father? Well? Too much mystification might lead one to believe that both priests were one and the same, mightn't it? What do you have to say? What would you want me to say? That's up to you. Well, then, I'd say that a man of intelligence would not be led to believe anything on so little evidence. You're perfectly right. We've checked on every priest in Quebec. Each can account for his movements at the time of the murder. That is, each, except one. Where were you at 11 o'clock, Father? I was walking. Alone? No. Good. Now, if you'll just give me the name and address of the person... I can't. Father, don't you want to help me? I've done my best. But you refuse to answer my questions. I know, I know, and I'm sorry, but it isn't possible for me to answer them. It's a pity. A great pity. But I thank you for coming, Father. Good night. Good night, Inspector. <laughs> This is LaRue. Get me Mr. Robertson. Yes, yes, the Crown Prosecutor. Try his house. If he isn't home, find out where he is. I've got to talk to him. Before we continue with Act Two of I Confess, here's Francis Scully, our Hollywood reporter. What are you reading, Francis? Well, I've got a batch of reviews on the world premiere of The Robe, Ken. 20th Century Fox held it in New York last Wednesday night. 6,500 people were invited and 6,000 more gathered outside the theater. Mm, imagine what Hollywood Boulevard will be like this Thursday night at the Hollywood premiere. How were the reviews, Francis? Oh, just listen to this, Ken. The New York Daily News gave The Robe four stars and four stars for CinemaScope, the first time in its history any picture received this rating. And uh, what else did they say about CinemaScope? Well, it's considered the greatest motion picture advance in sound. Mm. How big is that CinemaScope screen again, Francis? Well, it's 65 feet long and 24 feet high. And it's so wide that a chariot has four white horses, not just two, thundering toward the audience. Not to mention close-ups of Richard Burton, Gene Simmons, and Victor Mature all at once. <laughs> I love this description of Victor Mature. They write that Victor plays the Greek slave, quote, with the controlled arrogance of a trained leopard, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> leopard, eh? And Jean Simmons? Oh, these are the words they use about her. Lovely and passionate. I could add a few words about Jean myself, such as complexion by Lux. And don't forget, Ken, the robe is in technicolor, so audiences will really see what Lux care can mean to a complexion. Well, Jean has been devoted to Lux for many years. I guess it's a habit she picked up in England. Well, Lux seems to be an international custom with most movie actresses. 
with so many pictures being made on location, Mexico, Rome, the Belgian Congo, why, well, I think you can call Lux the most traveled of all soaps. Yes, Lux gets around, all right. Like Gene Simmons, so many stars feel that Lux is the one soap they can depend on to keep their skin looking its very best. Lux is so gentle and mild. And another nice thing, the fragrance of Lux never interferes with any perfume you wear. Thank you, Francis. Once you've used Lux, we think you'll agree with Gene Simmons and nine out of ten screen stars, there's no soap quite like Lux. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's a few moments later. Mr. Robertson, the Crown Prosecutor, is not at home. But Inspector LaRue has found him. He's been a guest tonight in the home of some old friends, Pierre Granfort and his wife, Ruth. Sorry, Ruth. Looks like I've got to say goodnight. That phone call just now, it's about that Villette murder. You don't look so unhappy, Willie. Well, there's a very unpleasant angle. A priest is under suspicion. What nonsense. nonsense. Well, he was seen leaving Villette's house. Which priest? Do they know his name? Inspector LaRue thinks it's a Father Logan from St. Marie's. All right, hate to leave. Thanks for a lovely dinner. Good night, Willie. Oh, no, no, don't come to the door. See you soon, Pierre. Stop worrying. It's ridiculous. Why on earth would Father Logan... Shut up. Oh, please, shut up. I'm sorry. You're still in love with him. Am I? You never spoke about it. And I'm not going to speak about it but now. But you are going to speak about it. I'm not going on like this. Do whatever you wish. It's very simple, isn't it? What does one do when his wife's in love with a priest? You can leave me. How easily you can say that. I'm not in love with you. I have never been in love with you. You know that. I never wanted to believe it. That's not my fault. I've never pretended anything with you. I hope he's in trouble. Terrible trouble. Oh, my God. Michael. Hello? St. Marie's Rectory? I want to speak to Father Logan, please. Father Logan? Oh, but he is asleep. I'm not asleep, Mrs. Keller. Oh, oh it is very late. I'll take it. Thank you. Good night, Father. Hello? Michael, I've got to see you. Oh. Ruth, please. That's impossible. I've got to see you tomorrow morning. I've got to meet you somewhere. Michael, aren't you listening? Uh, I hear you. I'm going to Levis tomorrow morning. The ferry, Michael. The nine o'clock ferry. All right. Good night. <laughs> Well, good morning. Good morning, Father Logan. Walk over here. We shouldn't be seen together for your sake. I had to see you. Ruth, the police have been questioning me. They saw the two of us talking outside of Villette's house. They're trying to find out who you are. I don't care. I've got to tell you, you're being suspected. I know that. The only thing is for me to tell them that you were with me that night. You can't. They'll want to know why. I'll tell them everything if I have to. You've got to think of yourself. You've got to think of your husband. Think of him? Before I think of you, I've never been able to do that. You must. It's too late to think of him. I'm not that good. I love you. I've always been in love with you. I know, I know it's wrong, but I can't help it. Do you want me to lie to you? No, I don't want you to lie to yourself. I haven't changed, Michael. I've been married seven years, and I haven't changed. But I've changed, and you must understand. I'm a priest. I chose to be what I am. I believe in what I am. Michael. Ruth, I, I want you to see things as they are and not go on hurting yourself. Don't pity me. Our meeting like this is wrong. It's all wrong. It won't happen again. I won't bother you again. Goodbye. Ruth. Ruth, who was it? Who just telephoned? Willie Robertson. He wants me to come to his office now. Why? 
I was seen on the ferry this morning with Michael Logan. Apparently, I was being followed by a detective. Would you like to tell me what you're going to do? Answer whatever questions they ask me. I, I'm going to tell them why Michael could not have killed Vallette. Oh. Has Father Logan cleared himself to your satisfaction? He didn't have to. I was with him at the time. Would you like me to go with you? I'm in no position to ask favors, am I? Get ready. I'll get the car. Thank you. Ruth, Pierre, I I'm so terribly sorry about all this. Oh, this is Inspector LaRue. Good evening. Uh, Inspector LaRue has promised to keep all this from the press. That is, I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Father Logan is here. Here? Yes, the other room. If you'll join us, Father, please. Good evening, Father Logan. Good evening. Good evening. Father Logan. May we begin, please? What is it you want to know? Madame, you met Father Logan on the ferry this morning. Yes. May I ask the reason for this meeting? I don't think the reason could help you, Inspector. You also met Father Logan on the morning following Vallette's murder in front of the house. Yes. And the reason for this meeting? I had an appointment with Monsieur Vallette. But Father Logan, knowing of the murder, stopped you from entering the house, am I right? Yes. Of course, Father did not know you had an appointment. But he did know. The night before, I'd met Father Logan. I told him I was going to see Vallette at half past nine the following morning. Madame, just so I don't misunderstand, you met Father Logan on the night that Vallette was murdered? Yes. Where? We took a drive in my car. At what time, please? Between nine and 11. Are you sure of the time, madame? Yes, I, I came home just after 11. My husband had come in just five minutes before. That's correct, Inspector. You, uh, you told your husband that you'd just seen Father Logan? No, I, I did not tell my husband. Inspector, I beg you, must your questions be so personal? Madame, do you understand why I must ask these questions? Yes. And I came here to tell you that Father Logan could not have been involved in Monsieur Vallette's death because I was with him at the time. I accept everything you have said, madame. But I must know the reason for your appointment with Vallette. Vallette was blackmailing me. He... he was what? I met Father Logan to ask his advice. But your husband? You had not told your husband about this? No, no, it was nothing to do with my husband. You turned to Father Logan for advice, but not to your husband. Father Logan is an old friend. Then he knew that you were being blackmailed. How could he? I hadn't seen him in years. But you just called him an old friend. Inspector LaRue. Yes, just a moment, LaRue. My wife is not under oath. She doesn't have to answer these questions. Monsieur, I have only one more question. Why were you being blackmailed, madame? You needn't answer that. Why shouldn't she? Ruth, it isn't necessary. Don't answer. Madame, are you trying to protect Father Logan? From what? He hasn't done anything. It would seem as if he had. You don't care whom I hurt, do you? Just as long as I answer your questions. Madame, a man has been murdered. Ruth, if you, if you think you'd like the advice of a lawyer... Thanks, Willie. I don't think that will be necessary. The blackmail was about me and Father Logan, Inspector. You were aware of this, Father? Yes. If you will continue, Madame. I'll have to go back a long time to the beginning of the war. It was long before Michael had entered the church. He was working then for the government, and we, we'd fallen in love. He was one of the first to volunteer. I, I hated him for that. I was selfish even then. He took things so seriously, war and love. Yes, even love. I begged him to marry me before he left, but he wouldn't. It seemed so long ago. Ruth, how can you talk of our getting married? You know I'll be shipping out soon. Oh, but darling, that's why I want to marry you. Oh, my, aren't there enough widows as it is? Michael. You think I don't love you enough. I love you too much. Much too much. Don't you see? There's just no telling when I'll get back. Or uh, if I ever will. Meanwhile, you'd better forget about me. How can you say that if you love me? Ah, uh, if I love you. There never can be anyone else, never. Ruth, won't you understand? It's so unfair to you. You think it's fair to tell me to forget you? <laughs> you know something? 
You're a very stubborn girl, aren't you? His letters were long at first, but after a while there were no letters at all. Nothing, not a word, for over a year. Meanwhile, I'd started working for my future husband. Pierre was, he was... Ruth, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them anything more. I want to. You were very kind to me, Pierre. You realized I was unhappy. And like all kind people, you never asked me why. I was in love with you. Anyway, six months later, we were married. When the war was over, Michael came home. I was at the dock the day the boat arrived. We arranged to meet the following afternoon. It was a lovely day, the end of the summer. We took the ferry and went over to the island. We started to walk, and Michael told me the thoughts that had come to him during the war. The war had changed him. Then suddenly a storm came. <laughs> This won't do at all, will it? You don't even have a jacket. Oh, what's a little rain? Come on, let's run for it. There must be some place we can go. Where are we, anyway? Oh, I don't know. It was a beautiful meadow a minute ago. Oh, you're getting soaked. Oh, look, there's a house across the field. Maybe they'll let us stay there. The house was closed, Inspector. Locked. The storm grew worse. There was a summer house in the garden, a roof and lattice and ivy. It was the only shelter we could find. Sometime during the night, the rain stopped. It was sunlight that awakened me. Michael was seated at a table, his head on his arms. He, he was still asleep. And then a man came walking through the garden. Hello. Well, I've been entertaining guests, I see. He called again and Mike awakened. What a charming rendezvous. I trust you and the lady were not disturbed during the night. But what a compromising situation, monsieur. Michael, no, don't. He, he only defends your honor, madame. Get out. Get out? From my own garden? That doesn't give you the right to insult Madame this. Grandfort? Oh, yes, I know, madame. Ruth? That is, I know of her husband, the distinguished member of parliament. I've seen you quite often, madame, waiting for him in your car. Oh, how exciting it must be to be young. Young and beautiful. This man, Villette? Villette. What could I say to Michael? I hadn't told him I was married. Father? Let her continue. I didn't see Michael again for five years, nor Villette either. Not till the day that Michael was ordained a priest. Villette attended the ceremonies. And after that, I started to run into him all the time. One day as I left the house, he was waiting for me on the sidewalk. And those are the facts, Madame Grandfort. If I don't act quickly, there'll be a terrible tax scandal. Only your husband can help me. Then go to my husband. There's nothing I can do. But your husband is so righteous, madame. You, uh, you could persuade him to use his influence, couldn't you? You can't be serious. Madame, must I tell your husband about you and Father Logan? Must I? There's nothing you can tell him. We did nothing wrong. Think it over. I'll give you 24 hours. I was helpless, frantic. If Follette started to talk, Pierre's career in politics would be finished. Michael might be unfrocked. I thought that maybe Michael might help. I telephoned him at the rectory. We met that night, and as we drove around the city, I told him what had happened. I want you to take me back to the rectory, Ruth, and uh, then I want you to go home. What are you going to do? Leave Follette to me. I'll talk to him. Can you, uh, can you meet me in front of his house tomorrow morning, say, at uh, 9.30? Yes, yes, of course. It'll be all right, Ruth. Villette will listen to reason. Don't worry about it anymore. So that explains your appointment with Villette. Yes, I see. I arrived at 9.30. I 
couldn't understand why the crowd had gathered. Then I saw Michael and he told me Valette was dead. I couldn't believe it. I was free. The rest you know. Some of it, anyway. Inspector, may my wife leave now? Certainly. Father Logan has his alibi now, doesn't he, Willie? Of course. Thank you. Ruth, come. Good night. Thank Good you, night, madame, Ruth. for your help tonight. Yeah, Willie. Would you like to go now, Father? I said, would you like to go now? Hmm? Uh, go? It's been a terrible ordeal. We're very grateful. Yes. Well, good night. Well, it's over, Inspector. Is it, sir? I'd like you to see this report. What report? Dr. Bonard, the autopsy surgeon. He claims that Valette could not have died before 11.30. Oh, wait Madame a moment. Madame Granfor said that she left Father Logan at 11. You can do a lot of things in 30 minutes. I had never quite understood why Father Logan should have killed Valette. But now I think I can understand. And I thought it was over. I'm afraid not, Mr. Robertson. Only beginning. We'll continue with Act Three of I Confess in just a few moments. Now we're going to meet lovely Joan Weldon, who was signed by Warner Brothers while singing in Song of Norway. What singing haven't you been doing lately, Joan? I'm in So This Is Love, Mr. Cummings, but I don't sing. I'm actually more interested in becoming a dramatic actress like Barbara Stanwyck. You don't come any better than Barbara. I saw her in the new Milton Sperling production, Blowing Wild, at the studio recently. Gary Cooper, Ruth Roman, and Anthony Quinn are stars in it, too. It was shot in Mexico, mostly near Cuernavaca, and the cast lived in one, at one of those old, established world places. Built in 1527 by Cortez, the Spanish conqueror. Sounds like the picture Blowing Wild would have some wonderful scenery in it. Oh, it has, Mr. Cummings. And a very exciting story involving oil fields and armed bandits. Judging by the looks of Miss Stanwyck at the end of the picture, well, I hope she had Lux toilet soap along with her. Why is that, Joan? Miss Stanwyck was covered with oil and debris. She plays the part of an unscrupulous woman infatuated with Gary Cooper. And I guess you'd say she gets her just desserts in the end. Well, Joan, knowing how much Barbara Stanwyck likes Lux, I'm sure she brought several cakes along. Lux is my favorite soap, too, Mr. Carpenter, for my complexion and in my bath. Most screen stars feel that way about Lux, Joan. They believe there's nothing more refreshing than a Lux bath. It's a great pick-me-up after a strenuous day. It certainly is, Mr. Carpenter. Well, thank you, Joan, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you in a dramatic role soon. Use the generous bath size Lux. We think you'll like its creamy lather and pleasant fragrance as much as nine out of ten Hollywood screen stars do. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. Curtain rises on Act Three of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's very early the following morning, but already the phone has rung in the ground for home. An urgent call from Mr. Robertson, the prosecutor. And now Ruth has rushed to the church of St. Marie. But I can't talk to you now, Ruth. There are people waiting at the confessional. Mr. Robertson, phone. They're going to arrest you. Oh, Michael, what can we do? I don't know. You're not going to let them bring you to trial. Don't you know what that would mean? I've done this to you. I've done it all. No, no, you mustn't say that. They're going to call me as a witness, and all because of what I told them last night. They claim I've given them the motive they've been waiting for. Ruth, please, I must go now. I should have lied, but I told the truth. And now they'll twist everything I've said. They'll turn it, they'll use it. I wanted to help you, to help you. Well, it doesn't matter. There's nothing either of us can do. Father Logan. Keller? What is it? I, I can talk to you now. You are through with confessions? Yes. 
You have been talking to the police. They asked about me. You told them about me? I'm going to be arrested, Keller. You? You are trying to frighten me. You think by telling me that I will give myself up. So what are you going to do when they arrest you? I don't know. Ah, you are frightened. Maybe they will hang you instead of me, and that frightens you. But you can't tell them, can you? You can't tell them as long as you are a priest. Come in. Father Logan. You've been looking for me, Inspector LaRue? Yes, Father, yes, indeed we've been looking for you. For about three hours we've been looking for you, every policeman in Quebec. I've been walking. I've been trying to think. You can call it off, Murphy. He just walked in. You had lunch yet, Father? No. Well, let me order something for you. Oh, uh, you're under arrest. Yes, I know. Priest arrested for murder. Father Logan charged with Valette murder. Robertson plans speedy trial of accused priest. If you will tell the court once again, Sergeant Murphy, where did you find this priestly garment, this cassock? The rectory, sir, Father Logan's room. I found it hidden in his trunk. Hidden? Objection, my lord. On what grounds can the witness claim the article was hidden? Sustained. Sorry, my lord. The Crown is content to establish only the fact that the cassock was in the accused trunk. Now then, Sergeant, what did the police do with this cassock? We sent it to Dr. Bernard, pathologist at Laval University. I have his signed report here, sir. It's Dr. Bernard's opinion that the cassock was stained with human blood. Whose blood? The report says that the blood type is identical to that of the murdered man, Vallette. Thank you. Now, if it please the court, the Crown would like to recall the witness whom we heard yesterday, but very briefly. Will Otto Keller take the stand? Now then, Mr. Keller, you told us yesterday that you spoke with Father Logan on the night of the murder at approximately 11.45 o'clock. Yes, sir. Under what circumstances? My wife was asleep, sir. I was just about to go to bed, so I opened the window. I saw someone entering the church. Who? I could not tell at that distance, sir, so I went downstairs and walked out of the rectory and across to the church. I saw someone kneeling against the altar rail. As he lifted his head, I saw it was Father Logan, sir. Was there anything about his manner that seemed out of the ordinary? He seemed so distressed, sir. I asked him if he were ill. He said no. He said I should go back and leave him alone. Did you go back? No, sir. Father Logan had always been so very kind to my wife and to me. I wanted to help him if I could. Well? He told me again to leave him alone, so I went back to our room. Your witness, Mr. Crawley. The defense waves examination at this time, my lord. Waves examination. Then the Crown calls Madame Granfor to the stand. Madame Ruth Granfor, please. But I can't answer your questions in any other way. How can I when you repeatedly twist my words around and rephrase them? The witness will kindly confine herself to answer as to the facts. Madame Granfor, you just told us you were in love with the accused prior to the war. Yes. But what we are trying to find out is whether or not you were still in love with the accused on that night of Villette's murder. Yes, yes. Thank you. And how often had you met with him between the night at the summer house on the island and the night Villette was killed? Never, never. You want this court to believe that a woman in love doesn't make some attempt to I meet her lover? My lord. This line of questioning doesn't seem particularly relevant. But it is, my lord. I am trying to discover whether or not Villette's blackmail was based on his knowledge not merely of a single meeting between the accused and the witness, but of a continuous, uninterrupted no, series of... No, that's not of... true! It's not true! <laughs> my lord, the witness appears to be on the verge of hysteria. May I excuse her for the moment and call the accused? Does the defense object? No objections, my lord. Call the accused. Father Michael Lowe. Suppose we begin with the cassock, Father Logan. This is your cassock. No, sir. 
It is not mine. Then perhaps you borrowed it from someone? No. Yet it was found in your trunk. Someone must have put it there? Yes. Or can you help us by suggesting who? I can't say. Father Logan, when did you decide to become a priest? After the war. And in becoming a priest, were you perhaps trying to hide from something? I've never thought of the priesthood as offering a hiding place. It involves certain responsibilities, certain morality. Yes. And yet you saw nothing wrong in having a clandestine meeting with a woman. Are you trying to imply that I was a priest at that time? I was not a priest. But did you consider that this woman was married? I, I wasn't aware that she was. And so you spent the whole day with her. Yes, yes, we were good friends. I hadn't seen her in over three years. Such good friends that you made no effort to go home that night? We were caught in a storm. Oh, then the storm was the villain. I saw nothing wrong in being caught in a storm. Nothing wrong. Then why, on the following morning, did you hit Villette with your fist? Were you anxious to protect Madame's reputation? Yes. Oh, then her reputation was endangered. You suddenly realized there was something more than merely being caught in the storm. Villette. Villette made insinuations. My argument with Villette had nothing to do with any sudden realization. But you hit him in anger. Yes. You hit a man when he merely intruded upon a harmless situation then surely you are capable of far more violence when that same man blackmails your friend, Madame Granfort. I am not capable of murder. You would go to such a man, and unable to control your temper, unable to face a public scandal, you would turn again to physical force. No, I would not. No, you would not. You say that you and Madame separated at 11 o'clock on the night of the murder. That's right, yes. Then it was possible for you to be at Villette's house by half past 11. Yes, it was possible, but I did not go there. I went back to the rectory. And what did you do, Father Logan? I, I went up to my room. Then I went downstairs and into the church. Did you see anyone there? Otto Keller. Well, Mr. Keller has told the court that the time then was 11.45 or after. That isn't true. Then perhaps you are prepared to tell us the truth. I have told you the truth. That is all you have to say. That is all. And I say that you did not return to the rectory until 11.45 or after. That you had met with Villette, that he threatened you with exposure, and that you then proceeded to kill him. No! No! <laughs> Prosecution rest case. Defense blast circumstantial evidence. Judge charges jury. Church withholds all comments. Verdict awaited. Priest to hang if guilty. Silence. Silence. Everybody stands. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed on your verdict? We are. Is Michael Logan guilty of murder or not guilty? While we attach grave suspicions to the accused, we cannot find sufficient evidence to prove that he actually killed Monsieur Villette. Our verdict is not guilty. Oh. <laughs> silence! Silence! Michael Logan, while I have no doubt, as judge of this trial, that the jury reached their conclusions in utmost regard for justice, I must express my personal disagreement with their verdict. Michael Logan, you are hereby discharged, and this court is adjourned. Well, Laro, I told you the cassock wouldn't be enough. They've ruined him. Why couldn't they just have said not guilty and let it go at that? Are you satisfied, Willie? Are you satisfied with all this? Do you think I enjoyed it, Pierre? Someday, perhaps, you and Ruth may forgive me. Ruth? Pierre, look. You're out the window. What are they doing to him? People are angry, madame. If he were anyone else They're but a priest... They're throwing things at him. They're hurting him. The police will handle it. There, you see? I can't even help him now. And after all I've done to him... LaRue, look. Isn't that Mrs. Keller out there? What's she doing? Yes. She's shouting something. She's pointing to her husband and shouting, I'd better get down there. Those were shots. Mrs. Keller. Someone shot Mrs. Keller. What is 
Inspector Murphy, what happened? She was running toward me, Mrs. Keller. She kept shouting, he's innocent, the priest is innocent. Keller was about 20 feet in back of her. He shot her twice. Where is she? They've just taken her to that chop over there. Who's getting a statement? No one, sir. She's dead. And Keller? He won't get far. We're after him now. He ran into the hotel down there. I don't want him shot. Well, he's still got the gun, sir. I don't want him dead. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Now, where's Father Logan? He went in the shop where Mrs. Keller is. Well, Father? All she was able to say was, forgive me. We, we should have Keller in a few minutes. Now, what about him? Well, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Why did he shoot his wife? Why did she say you were innocent? I can't answer that. Keller worked in the rectory. He also worked as Vallette's gardener. What else can you tell me about him? Well, will you let me try to talk to him? We've got to catch him first. All right, Father, come along. He's somewhere in the hotel. Thank you. What are you trying to do, Father? Protect him? I... I think we better go to the hotel. We've got him cornered, Inspector. Behind those doors is a ballroom. No place to hide. Just the floor and a stage. Every exit's covered. I've just sent Farouche for tear gas. Oh, no, please. Let me try to talk to him. No. Murphy, open the doors. Now, the rest of you, stand back. You ready? Go ahead. Keller? What do you want? I want you to give yourself up. Why would I do that? You shot your wife. Isn't that enough? And what about Villette? Villette? So the priest talked. Logan, where are you, Father Logan? Keller. Ah, so you are there. How kindly you hear my confession and then a little shame, a little violence. That's all it takes to make you talk. I'm going in there. Now get back, Father. I'll kill you. You show yourself the hypocrite, the pretender. I thought you would rather die than to betray your faith. Keep him covered, Murphy. Yes, sir. Now get ready. Aim for Keller's shoulder. Make him drop the gun. Be easier to hit his leg, sir. Shoulder, the right shoulder. Gonna shoot now, Keller. Drop your gun and we shoot. Oh, no, please. Don't make them do it, Keller. That is all you have to tell me. Oh. 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 Drop your gun, Otto. There's been enough bloodshed. You... Must not come closer, Father. I'll shoot you, you know. You won't shoot me, Otto. Why will I not shoot you? Because you call me Otto in such a friendly way, like Alma used to call me Otto. Where is my Alma? She's dead. No. You killed her. It is your fault. Oh, I loved her. It made me cry to see her work so hard. Her poor hands, her poor beautiful hands. She can't be dead. She is. And I, I am as alone as you are. Oh, no. Yes. I'm not alone. Yes, you are. To kill you now would be a favor to you. You have no friends. What has happened to your friends, huh, Father? They mob you. They spit at you. It would be better if you were as guilty as I. Then they would shoot you quickly. Look. Three bullets. For you, Father. For you. Oh. Oh. Get a doctor, the hotel doctor. Father. Stand back, please, all of you. Forgive me. Forgive me. My head. Hold my head. Yes, Otto. Pray for me. Ego te absolvo. In nomine Patris. Et fili. Et spiritus sancti. Amen. It's all over. Yes. I want you to know I, I'm going home with my husband. In a moment, our stars will return. Now here's Hollywood's recommendation for sunshine the year round, Mr. Art Linkletter. Thank you, Ken. And ladies, are you proud to show off your linen closet? You know, a well-kept linen closet is one mark of a good housekeeper. And of course, it's important to have your towels and sheets and all your linens smell just as clean and fresh as they look. 
And when you wash them with surf, you know they're clean clear through because they smell clean. There's no need to worry about unpleasant odors like stale sour soap or the almost medicinal odor left by some detergents. You like the clean sunshine freshness of your surf-washed linens. Mmm, when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. And that's true no matter where you dry them, indoors or out, on damp days or dry ones. All-purpose surf is the safe white detergent for your linens and for everything you wash. And when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. And we call them forward for a curtain call. Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter. Harry, I certainly enjoyed your work in a dramatic part. Hmm. I think people are inclined to forget what a fine dramatic actor Carrie is. Well, of course, of course. Well, it was nothing. I just play anything at all. Anything from comedy to opera. <laughs> bang, bang. You sing opera, Carrie? Well, of course. I used to be in those romantic musicals, you know, where everybody raises a stein to dear old USC. <laughs> I even had a solo. Oh, you did? What did you sing? Um, High Barmaid. <laughs> well, I was a pay barmaid. Why don't you combine your talents and sing comic opera? Remember the Beggar's Opera? Oh, yes. Lawrence Olivia just made the famous old comic opera into a motion picture in England for Warner uh, yeah. Brothers. He's pretty versatile, too. Yeah, well, I think I'll leave singing in Shakespeare to Sir Lawrence, and I'll just stick to drama and comedy. <laughs> Very wise, Carrie. I believe in staying with whatever you have confidence in. You said it. <laughs> That's why I've always been a devoted fan to Lux Toilet Soap. It certainly is a dependable complexion, Ken. Yeah, we can always depend on the Lux Radio Theater for the best in motion pictures. So, uh, what's for next week, Irving? It's not only one of 20th Century Fox finest pictures, but it tells the story of some of our most exciting American history. It's the great love story of Rachel and Andrew Jackson in The President's Lady. And as our stars, we'll have dynamic Charlton Heston recreating his original role. And as his co-star, lovely and talented, Joan Fontaine. Oh, that will be a wonderful show. Good night. Good night. Good night. And see you soon. Good morning, honey. When you say good morning, does your breath say... Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. It won't if you use Chlorident toothpaste. Chlorident absolutely gets rid of that stale, furry taste that's a sure sign of bad breath. Some toothpaste only mask bad breath temporarily. But with Chlorident, that wonderful, clean, fresh feeling tells you your breath is sweet, even hours later. Chlorident hasn't got a little dab of chlorophyll. It's loaded with it. And it's got a patented polishing agent that cleans better than any other toothpaste formula bar none. A great university proved it. Anti-enzyme? Certainly. One brushing stops dangerous acid formations that cause decay for nine out of ten people for hour after hour after hour. So to get rid of morning mouth, get Chlorident. Then when you say good morning, your breath says clean and fresh. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine in The President's Lady. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Jack Crucian as LaRue, Leonard Penn as Keller, Edgar Barrier as Robertson, Shep Mencken as Murphy, George Baxter as Pierre, Ann Morrison as Alma, Charlie Lung as Villette, Jill Oppenheim as Augustine, Bill Johnstone as the defense attorney, and Herb Butterfield, Tony Michaels, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Well, Francis, why that big smile? Well, I just sort of found $10. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I did some figuring, Ken, and came out $10 ahead. Oh, great. How'd you do that? Well, it's like this. I buy about 15 pairs of nylons a year. I spend, oh, a dollar and a quarter to a dollar thirty-five a pair. Mm -hmm. Say, $20 a year for stockings. Now, like any smart gal, I give my sheer nylons Lux Flakes care and... And get double the stocking wear. Hmm? So I cut stocking costs in half and save $10 a year. Now, isn't that money found? You bet it is, Francis. 
And any woman can do it just by giving her delicate nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. So don't wash your nylons harshly in wash day products. You see, Lux Flakes keep nylon threads strong and elastic, so they're less likely to break and cause runs. That's why 96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. And Lux Flakes are guaranteed safe by Lever Brothers. Remember, if you want double your stocking wear, be sure to use Lux Flakes Care. Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees the quality and performance of Lux Toilet Soap, Lux Flakes, Chlorodent Toothpaste, and Surf, or your money refunded. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The President's Lady, starring Charlton Heston and Joan Fonte. <laughs> Every Thursday evening, Lieber Brothers Company brings you the Lux Video Theater. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. This is the CBS Radio Network. Lux presents Hollywood. Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring... Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire in A Blueprint for Murder. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, A Blueprint for Murder, is a spine-tingling mystery. The thrilling drama of a romance which was overshadowed by the suspicion of murder. It's the quandary of a young man who suspects that the... Lovely young widow of his brother may be a diabolical poisoner. And as our stars, we have popular Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire creating two unusual roles in this suspenseful motion picture from 20th Century Fox. But for a moment, let's listen to Ken Carpenter. They say it's springtime that'll turn a young man's fancy to uh, thoughts of you-know-what. But I know that a really feminine-looking gal can turn a man's fancy and his head any time of the year. And there's nothing more feminine than sheer, lovely nylon stockings. And, of course, no care but Lux Flakes care for them. Ninety-six percent of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. It pays you to follow their advice because Lux Flakes care can actually double the wear you get from every pair. So always give your nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. And uh, when you're picking up Lux Flakes at the market, be sure to get the new Lux, too, Lux Liquid Detergent. It's made just for the dishes job. Even though the carpenters have been using Lux Liquid for months now, I still can't get over how quickly it floats grease off plates and glasses. And so little will do so much. Just a teaspoonful does a dishpan full. While it's rough on grease, Lux Liquid is gentle on your hands. Every bit as mild as you'd expect a Lux product to be. The can it comes in is special, too. It has a wonderful new dripless spout that makes it almost impossible for anyone, including me, to mess up the sides of the can. Yes, Lux Liquid is the next best thing to a dishwashing machine. As good for dishes as Lux Flakes are for nylons. If you don't agree, both are all we say. Lever Brothers will give you back whatever you paid for them. Now, Act One of A Blueprint for Murder, starring Dan Daly as Cam and Dorothy McGuire as Lynn Cameron. The telegram was waiting for me in New Orleans. The telegram from Lynn. I took the next plane back and rushed to the hospital. Late that afternoon, the doctor was able to give us some real encouragement. And so I think our worries are over, Mr. Cameron. But she was a mighty sick little girl. You still don't know what was wrong? Not for sure. The tetany test was negative. Tetany? Those muscular spasms she was having, they're quite characteristic. Well, I'm sure she'll have quite a comfortable night. I understand you're the child's uncle, is that right? 
Yes, her father's dead, and my brother. I'm very attached to both children and their stepmother. Now, Mrs. Cameron's had quite an ordeal. Why not uh, take her home? We uh, will have a special nurse on duty, and if anything at all yes, comes up... I'll, I'll try and get her to leave now. Oh, I wouldn't think of leaving here if it weren't for Doug. Oh, poor little boy. He doesn't know what to make of all this. I'll phone him and tell him I'm coming. There's a booth down the corridor. Cam, now that you're here, how about spending a few days with us? I'd really like to, Lynn, but I should get back tomorrow. We're opening a new field in Venezuela. <laughs> you're always roaming all over the world. Did it ever occur to you that we might like to see you once in a while? It's so important to the children, especially Doug. He's never quite got over Bill's death, and he's so fond of you. Let me see what I can do. Maybe I can stay over a few days. Oh, I wish you would. Well, here's your phone booth. I'll look up a public stenographer. I got some letters and a couple of telegrams to get off. I'll meet you at the house. Wonderful. We'll expect you for dinner. And, Cam, thanks for everything. Gosh, Lynn, do I have to go to bed? Can't we play just one more game? It's way past your bedtime, Doug, and tomorrow's school. But Uncle Kim's only going to be here for a few days. And we're going to have fun for those few days, too. How about the ice show tomorrow? Oh, boy. Gee, I wish Polly could go, too. It was awful last night, Uncle Kim. The way she kept yelling, don't touch my feet. Yes, uh, I know, but I think we should try and get that out of our minds, Doug. Dad was just like that when he died. Just like that? Well, I'm afraid Doug's letting his imagination run away with him. But he was. All stiff and funny, too. Just just the same as Polly. Is that right? Well, there was some similarity, I suppose. But the doctors all agreed that Bill had virus encephalitis. Anyway, there must be a lot of things with the same symptoms. Yes, I suppose so. Have you told Uncle Canham about your baseball team, Doug? Boy, have we got a team. I knocked two home runs last week. Uh, if we were up in Boston, Slugger, we could see the Red Sox play. Say, how about letting Doug spend the summer with me? Oh, please, Lynn, please. Well, why not? Sounds wonderful. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, let's see. I've still got the sailboat out in the Cape. I ought to take care of the weekends, and during the week... We... Lynn took us up to Lake George last summer, and I learned a lot about boats, Uncle Kim. Seems to me Lynn's been mighty good to you. She sure has. Well, good night, Uncle Kim. Good night, Doug. Good night, Lynn. Sleep well, dear. And just call if there's anything you want. I will. See you in the morning, Uncle Cam. You've been wonderful. The way you're bringing up those kids. They're nice kids. It hasn't been hard. When their mother died, I thought no one would ever be able to take her place. They really love you, Lynn. I don't see how they can help it. I always thought Bill was a lucky man. Now I'm beginning to realize just how... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes, we'll be right there. Cam, that was Dr. Stevenson at the hospital. Polly? He told us to come right over. She's had a relapse. Cam! Well, well, when did you hit town? Hello, Fred. Well, come in. Hey, Maggie, look who's here. Oh, this is wonderful. We haven't seen you in ages. Had your breakfast? Fred, uh, I've got bad news. I wouldn't be here at this hour except... It's Polly, Fred. Polly's dead. Dead? Cam, full of all the wonderful surprises. Take it easy, honey. Some terrible news. Little Polly Cameron. She's dead. She's what? I just can't believe it. Accident? No, no, she took sick. When, Cam, when? Early this morning at the hospital. Oh, what a tragedy. And Lynn and poor little Doug, how's he taking it? Well, they're both under sedatives. Your breakfast, please go ahead. You'll have some coffee anyway. I'll get another cup. I have no right to barge in like this, and I should have phoned you first. That's a fine way to talk to an old friend. Fred, you're still handling the estate, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course. Cam, what was wrong with Polly? Well, the doctor seemed rather uncertain. He doesn't know? Sometimes it's hard to tell, I suppose, but there's one thing about it that bothers me. Well? Apparently, Polly had the same sort of convulsions that Bill had before he died. Cam, are you sure of that? I'm not sure of anything. I, I only know that Polly kept screaming, don't touch my feet. That's 
That's very curious. I don't see anything curious about it at all. It's, it's just that I'm afraid there might be something hereditary in all this and that it could hit Doug, too. Cam, you weren't here when Bill died, were you? No. Well, what did the doctors tell you he died from? Virus encephalitis, uh, sort of a sleeping sickness. Yet in Polly's case, they don't know? Somehow back in my mind, that don't touch my feet rings a bell. Maggie, please. She still writes for those pulp magazines. You know what an imagination she has. This has nothing to do with imagination. This was research I did at a medical library a couple of years ago. I had an idea for a story, and That's I... what I thought, a story. Well, maybe you're right. Forget it. Well, if there's something on your mind, say it. Well, I was looking up a murder case. The victim also had convulsions and kept screaming, don't touch my hand. So? He died of strychnine poisoning. Oh, Maggie, for heaven's sake, how can you even suggest such a thing? I only mean there's a, well, a similarity. You know nothing about what's happened, nothing. Maggie, don't you think the doctors would have recognized strychnine? Well, I don't know. They didn't in the case I looked up, and they apparently don't know what killed Polly. Let's see what the encyclopedia says about convulsions. Why do you always have to dramatize everything? You're really going off the deep end, Maggie. Well, look it up if you want to. She sees a man take a pocket knife to sharpen a pencil, and right away she starts building up a murder case. Well, don't both have you jump on me. I only mentioned it as something that should be looked into. Anyway, here it is in the encyclopedia. Let me see it. Well, they, they list eight causes. Tetanus. Only tetanus would have required a cut. Obviously, it wasn't rabies. Epilepsy? There's no history of it in the family. With all these others, like a brain tumor, there would have been earlier indications. All except one. Well? Read it. Poisons, especially the alkaloids such as strychnine. That doesn't prove anything. No, of course not. Uh, I'd like to use your phone. I'd like to call Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> Well, we thought of the possibility of strychnine, Doctor. You're serious about this, Mrs. Sergeant? I don't mean to be rude, Doctor, but you do admit you don't know what that child died from. Is this your idea, too, Mr. Cameron? I haven't any ideas, Doctor, but you told me it wasn't tetany, and yet that's what you put on the death certificate. Because that's what we were treating the patient for. She responded to the calcium, so we continued it. As a matter of fact, I suggested an autopsy. Oh? Lynn couldn't stand the idea. I agreed, and nothing could be gained by it. Mrs. Sergeant, just how do you think the child got the poison? I don't know, of course, but I don't see how it could have been accidental. I hope you realize what you're saying. Meanwhile, Mr. Cameron, I'm afraid I don't want any part of all this. I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. Come on, Cam, let's go. Thank you for seeing us. You're quite welcome, Mr. Cameron. Who could have done it, Maggie? Who? Oh, several people. For instance. For instance, Lynn. Good day, Dr. Stevenson. Maggie, what's got into you making a crazy crack like that about Lynn? Now, doggone it, I'm getting mad. I only said it was possible she could have done it, and it is. And you've got her all wrong. She certainly made Bill a good wife. He was very happy with her. Do you plan to stay on? Till the end of the week. The three or four days, huh? Can I drive you anywhere? No, no thanks. Think it over, Cam. It sounds ridiculous, I know. But is it? Say hello to Fred. I'll, I'll see you both in a day or two. I was with Lynn most of the next few days. More and more, I realized what a wonderful person she was. Her warmth and affection for Doug helped so much to soften the blow of his sister's death. Never did Maggie's suspicions seem more fantastic than now. Must you really leave tomorrow, Cam? I've stretched it as long as I could, Lynn. But I'll be back as soon as I can. You can rely on that. I don't know what I would have done without... Yes, Anna? It's the phone, ma'am, for Mr. Cameron. It's Mr. Sergeant. Tell him I'll call him back later, Anna. No, no, no. Go on. I'll run upstairs and see if Doug's asleep. I'll take it in the study, Anna. Yes, sir. Cam, I just wanted to know if you're still leaving in the morning. Yes, of course. Why? Well, I... I hesitate to talk about it on the phone. It's about your brother Bill's estate. Well? Under the terms of his will, Lynn shares in trust. She receives only the interest unless... Well, unless what? Now, I don't want you to think we're jumping at conclusions, Cam. We're not. It's just that I... Unless what? Unless both children were to die. Both Polly and Doug. 
Fred, what the devil are you trying to say? Well, it could provide a motive. I'm not amazed at you. I know how all this must sound, Cam, but I think you ought to stay over another day so we can talk it over. All right. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Cam? Anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, no, no. Fred just called to say goodbye. Oh, I hate that word. I told him he was being premature, and I've decided to stay a day or two longer. That is, if it's all right with you. You know it is. Was Doug all right? Oh, yes, thank goodness. I'm worried about him. He doesn't look at all well. It's been the same for him as for the rest of us. Mm. Such a terrible shock. No, but Doug hasn't been looking well for weeks. I'm thinking of taking him out of school camp, maybe a trip to Europe. Why? Well, he needs a change. Everything here only reminds him of his father and Polly. And it'd be good for me, too. How long would you be away? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a year or so. That long? Hmm. Might be very good for him. Visiting all the little out-of-the-way places and just taking it easy. I'm not worried about his schoolwork. He's such a bright boy. We could take some sort of study schedule with us, and that way it could be good. no point in getting excited about it, Cam. We're just talking about it among ourselves. But I can't close my eyes to the fact that Lynn did have a motive. I don't care how it adds up. You'll never convince me that Lynn is capable of murder. Bill left a lot of money, Cam. Almost a million dollars. And now you tell us she's thinking of taking Doug abroad. Yes, to those out-of-the-way places in Europe. Well, what do you want me to do? Be objective, that's all. Cam, I've gone through every book on poison cases I can find. There have been plenty of women who were poison murderers. Stop it, Maggie. Please. Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, Lydia Trueblood, dozens of others. Many of them were young, beautiful, intelligent, and cultured. You still refuse to answer a very simple question. If it was strychnine that killed Polly, why didn't the doctors recognize it? Because they weren't looking for it. Here's the dope on lots of famous poison cases. Not in one instance did a doctor call the turn based on medical diagnosis. You just can't dismiss it as impossible, that's all. At least I can't. And here's something else you might look over. This happened in Philadelphia. More than a hundred people killed by arsenic before even one of the cases was suspected. Yet that's the only case reported in Philadelphia in the last 20 years. All right. How do they account for it? Because there are so many diseases, apparently, that simulate poison symptoms. And the idea of murder seems so utterly incredible to the doctors that it doesn't even enter their minds. Don't think I'm sold on this theory, Cam, because I am not. Too many things don't make sense. If Lynn were guilty, for example, she'd have had Polly's body cremated. Lynn did want Polly cremated. I talked her out of it. Bill wouldn't have wanted it. I see. I, I, I didn't know. Then Polly could have been poisoned. Cam, we, we just can't dismiss this lightly. Well, I can and I will. And if Doug should also die, Cam, then what? Doug? Would you ever be able to forgive yourself? You're a lawyer. What do you suggest? I'm afraid there's only one thing to do. Talk to the police. Get a court order for an autopsy. All right. Let's get it over with. Cam? Aren't you coming in? Dinner's ready. Hmm? Oh, oh. What's the matter with you? You've been staring out of that window for half an hour. Ever since you got that phone call. Where's Doug? I told you. He's having dinner at his friends down the street. Lynn, uh, I've got to talk to you. Well, can't it wait until after dinner? No, it can't wait any longer. Lynn, uh, I don't know how to begin. That phone call before, it, it was about Polly... Polly was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. Oh. Why, it just couldn't be. Cam, there must be some mistake. I'm afraid not. But how? How could it have happened? The police think it was intentional. Police? Yes, it was their medical examiner who performed the autopsy. They want you and the servants down for questioning tomorrow morning. Oh, but this is impossible. It doesn't make any sense. The police... Well, what gave them the idea of performing an autopsy? Lynn, you know Dr. Stevenson wasn't certain what caused Polly's death. No. Well, uh, there was a reason for thinking it, it could have been strychnine. The symptoms are almost identical. And you knew about this, and you didn't even mention it to me. I didn't think they'd find anything wrong. 
was no purpose in upsetting you. I, I know it's miserable being dragged down to the police for a lot of oh, stupid well, questions. Oh, well, that can't be helped, but there's one fact we can't get away from. If Polly was poisoned, then somebody did it. And it's up to us to find that somebody. Yes, ma'am. I'll need your help more than ever now. I'll be here. Thank you. Before we continue with Act Two of A Blueprint for Murder, let's hear from Francis Scully. Well, I've been having spring fever, Ken, so I went to see Metro Goldwyn Mayer's romantic hit, Rhapsody. Well, I'd say that has the perfect cast for romance, Francis. Beautiful Elizabeth Taylor in Technicolor, and those two sensational screen discoveries, Vittorio Gossman and John Erickson. <laughs> yes, and in the picture, they are brilliant young musical artists. And you'll hear some of the world's greatest music. So I'm told. Doesn't Elizabeth Taylor play the role of the spoiled, willful girl they both love? That's right, Ken, in the most romantic performance of her career. The picture is in a delightfully carefree mood, and the background swiftly changes from Switzerland to Paris and the Riviera as the three young stars bring us the absorbing love story. Well, looks like MGM has another hit for their 30th anniversary. Good night, Francis. And now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of A Blueprint for Murder. Starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam. Lynn was questioned the following morning at police headquarters. Lieutenant Cole seemed almost apologetic. He dismissed her in a matter of moments. Then he brought Fred and me to Captain Pringle's office. Well, Lieutenant, where's Mrs. Cameron? I just let her go, Captain. She was very cooperative, but I'm afraid we didn't learn very much. Nothing from the servants, either. They're all very loyal to her. What'd she have to say about them? Nothing but the best. But it all seems to boil down to Mrs. Cameron, or the cook, or the maid, or the chauffeur. They were the only ones in the house the night the little girl took sick, except the little boy, of course. They had dinner at 7 o'clock. Polly took sick about 11.30, and no one admits giving her anything to eat in the meantime. Yet Strickland would have started to work in half an hour or so. Well... That's about it, I suppose. You don't sound very hopeful, do you? These poison cases are always dillies. It'll be very tough proving anything. Now, don't get the idea we're laying down, Mr. Cameron. But there have been only two poison murder convictions in the whole city of New York in the last 50 years, both based on confessions. There's nothing else you want us for? Uh, just one thing more. We're having your brother's body exhumed, Mr. Cameron. Why do you have to do that? I think you'll agree that if we find out that he was poisoned, too, it may go a long way toward helping us find the one we're looking for. He's right, Cam. You start on a case like this, and you never know where it's going to lead. We'll be in touch with you, Mr. Cameron. Thank you. Fred, where will you be late this afternoon? Maggie and I? Well, we're meeting for cocktails at the plaza. Any chance of joining us? Not for cocktails. But I may want to see you. Why? Well, I may have something. I may need some advice. Cam, Cam, over here. Hello, Maggie. Well, I've just come from the library. Oh, no, not you, too. I went through all those books on toxicology. Lynn couldn't have done it, only now I can prove it. How? You die of strychnine during a convulsion. You die of suffocation. Well, what does that mean? means that somebody gave Polly a second dose in the hospital. In the hospital? She was getting better. How could convulsions start all over again nearly 20 hours later? I never thought of that. No, and neither did the police or anyone else. Besides, I called the medical examiner and he had to agree. Well, of course, in all the strychnine cases we looked up, they either died in a few hours or they got well. And it proves that Lynn is absolutely innocent. But how could the hospital have given Polly strychnine? By mistake? That's what I've got to find out. I'm seeing Dr. Stevenson again in the morning. Well, here it is, Mr. Cameron, the patient's chart. The only medicines administered were all quite routine. They were supplied by our hospital pharmacy downstairs. What medicines? What was Polly given the night she died? Mm, at 10 o'clock, she was given calcium chloride pepsin in capsule form. We'd been giving her other calcium preparations, but she'd complained of the disagreeable chalky taste. So at uh, 
At 6.30, I switched to these. She was given a second capsule at 10.30. Well? No ill effects indicated. She took the third capsule at half past 11. Half an hour later, the convulsion started. Could the strychnine have been in that last capsule? Well, it's possible, of course. But I'd like to remind you, it came directly from the hospital pharmacy. Well, I'm scheduled for surgery. I'd like to check with you later, if I may. Thanks. I appreciate your help. Frankly, though, I, uh, I don't know what more I can add. Mr. Cameron, you want to see me? I'm Miss Brownell. The supervisor said you're the nurse who was on duty here the night my niece died. Oh, yes, and I can't tell you how sorry... Do you recall Dr. Stevenson asking you to have a prescription filled about 6.30? Well... Yes, vaguely. May I ask where you took the prescription? Well, the hospital pharmacy downstairs. They never saw that prescription. The pharmacy downstairs was, was closed. They close at 6 o'clock every night. They just told me so. Oh, of course, I remember now. I was just about to send it out when Mrs. Cameron offered to get it filled. Mrs. Cameron? Well, yes, the child's mother. I remember it very clearly now. Oh. Is that all, sir? Yes, thanks. But that wasn't all. In the morning, the police sent for the nurse. She reported to Captain Pringle's office. Now, tell us, Miss Brownell, how did you happen to ask Mrs. Cameron to get the medicine? Why, well, I didn't ask her. The hospital pharmacy was closed, and she offered to get the prescription filled herself. Who delivered it to the hospital? Well, she brought it back. What time was that? Oh, I imagine about 7.30. The capsules were in a bottle? Yes. The bottle was sealed? No. No, it was just an ordinary bottle cap. And it would have been possible for someone to have tampered with the capsules without you knowing about it, huh? Well, yes, I suppose so. That'll be all, Miss Brownell. Thank you very much for coming here. Not at all. Goodbye. Who's next? Uh, Miss Cameron's chauffeur, a fellow named Wheeler. Okay, bring him in. Now then, Wheeler, you say Mrs. Cameron left the hospital just after 6.30 and you drove her to that drugstore. Yes, sir. What time did you return to the hospital? Oh, about half past seven, a little earlier, maybe. How long did it take to get it filled? Mm, ten minutes, maybe. Then you should have been back at the hospital long before 7.30. Well, on our way back, Mrs. Cameron stopped off at her apartment. Oh, why? Mm, she didn't say. How long was she there? Not very long, a few minutes. You remember if she had the bottle with her when she went up to her apartment? Well, she, uh, well, she must have. Uh, she put it in her purse. You're positive? Uh, yes, sir. That's all, Willie. You can leave now. Thanks. Yes, sir. Well, we've seen the nurse, the chauffeur, the cook, and the maid. Only where are we? Who's waiting in your office? Uh, Mrs. Cameron, brother-in-law. That lawyer, sergeant, and sergeant's wife. Okay, we'll talk to Mrs. Cameron. Um, we'd better have a stenographer in here. Oh, that sounds encouraging. I can dream, can't I? Please sit down, Mrs. Cameron. Thank you. Oh, uh, you don't mind if the stenographer takes some notes? No, not at all, Lieutenant. I want to cooperate fully. Well, first of all, Mrs. Cameron, the nurse at the hospital tells us you offered to get that prescription filled. That's right, I did. But instead of returning to the hospital, you went home? Yes. Why'd you go there, Mrs. Cameron? To pick up some things for Polly. What things? Um comb, brush, toothpaste, things like that. The night before, there wasn't time to think of anything except getting the child to the hospital. Yes, of course. Um, how long would you say you remained in your apartment? Only a few minutes. Did you open the bottle containing the capsules? No, why should I? Then you had the chauffeur drive you back to the hospital where you handed the medicine to the nurse. Is that right? Exactly. You admit handing the medicine to the nurse. Admit, that's a strange word. You realize, Mrs. Cameron, that the fatal dose was definitely administered at the hospital. That's been proved. So I understand. Well, our next step is to find out who was responsible. You and Mr. Cameron were the only visitors? That's right. You and the hospital attendants were always present while Mr. Cameron was there. I know. So that rules him out. And there was always someone present while I was there. Nevertheless, the poison was somehow slipped into the calcium capsule, and all the medicine came directly from the hospital pharmacy except the bottle you gave the nurse. Now, this bottle was in your possession when you stopped off at your apartment. This gave you the opportunity to put the poison into the capsules. What's more, Mrs. Cameron, you're the one person with a motive. I'm sure you must realize what you're saying. Yes, yes, I do. 
The death of the two children would make you a very wealthy woman. You wanted the child cremated. You opposed an autopsy, though there was doubt as to the cause of the child's death, and Dr. Stevenson requested it. You think I did this thing? That I killed Polly? It's beginning to look that way, Mrs. Cameron. I love that child as if she were my own. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't. I couldn't. Well, that'll be all for now, Mrs. Cameron. If you'll just wait in the other room, please. I I'd like to speak with my brother-in-law. That's where you'll find him. I'd like to speak with him alone. Very well, Mrs. Cameron. Just come with me. Cam, they think I did it. They think I killed Polly. Yes, I, I know. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to keep calm. But I mustn't get unnerved. I, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. But I must. I, I must. Lynn. If, if things should go against me, Cam, what about Doug? From the way they talked, I may be held over for a trial or something. Well, yes, I suppose Cam, so. Cam, if it does happen, will you take Doug until it's all over? Of course. Of course I will. And try... Try not to let him ever hear about this. He mustn't know. But that day when I left police headquarters, I left with Lynn. They'd released her again, and for three more days, nothing happened. Nothing at least that we knew about. But they were very full days for the police. We've checked and double-checked everything, Mr. Henderson. That's why Cole and I have come to you. We're ready to turn the case over to the district attorney's office. You know how I feel about all this. I need a lot more answers than I've got now. Maybe we can give them to you. All right. What about the other pills in that bottle? There were a dozen capsules altogether. The child was given three. She had no reaction from the first two. The third was it, Strickland. I'm talking about the other nine. Negative. Exactly. You've drawn nothing but blanks. Where would she have got the poison? In a drugstore? Not if she's half as smart as you think she is. What about the apartment? Well, insecticides, we've gone through it twice with experts. Same with everything in the medicine cabinets. No trace of Strickland or any other poison. Yeah. And this is the case you want us to bring before a judge and jury? Huh? Yes, sir, because we know she did it. She must have done it. All right, leave everything here, all the reports. And keep digging. I can't take it to trial unless we get more evidence. Okay, okay, we'll keep trying. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. At the end of the following week, I went to the district attorney's office. I've told you a dozen times, Mr. Cameron, if we bring this woman up for preliminary examination, I'm absolutely certain no judge will hold her over for trial. Not on this evidence. You believe she's guilty, don't you? Well, what if I do? Captain Pringle does too, so does Cole. She's planning to take my nephew to Europe. Six months, a year, even five years from now, he'll suddenly die in some obscure place. You could be right, Mr. Henderson, and then by the time we hear about it, the body will have been cremated. That's all quite possible, Pringle, but it's supposition, not evidence. If there's no chance of winning the case, there's no sense bringing it into court. You mean you base your reputation on winning cases, not on losing them, so you play only the sure bets. He meant nothing of the kind. But if we don't come up with some new evidence, we're dead. So is the boy. The boy's life is in your hands. I don't appreciate your putting it quite that way. There's no other way to put it. I think there is. I think that we... Hello, this is Henderson. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, that was the medical examiner. There is no evidence of poison in connection with your brother's death. That at least would have been some help to us. That still doesn't alter the need of protecting my nephew. All right, Cameron, I don't like this, but under the circumstances, I suppose I have to. Pringle. Yes, sir. Get out a warrant for the arrest of Mrs. Len Cameron. Final act of a blueprint for murder in a moment. Now a moment with a beautiful young actress, Charlotte Austin. An extraordinary one, too. She made her debut at the advanced age of two weeks. Well, it wasn't even a walk-on part, Mr. Cummings. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I was walking at two weeks. Being the trooper you are, though, I suppose you want to tell me about a new picture of yours. Not mine, I'm sorry to say. 20th Century Fox, Cinemascope, Technicolor, The Works, but no Charlotte Austin. <laughs> you must mean Prince Valiant. A tremendous production, I hear, with a tremendous cast. 
James Mason, Janet Lee, Robert Wagner, and Deborah Padgett. Isn't it Hollywood's premiere on April 2nd? Uh-huh, and the New York premiere will be April 6th. Well, I guess just about everyone has read the wonderful adventure strip it's based on, grown-ups and children alike. 20th Century Fox went all out making the picture, too. Director Henry Hathaway traveled 10,000 miles through Great Britain to find authentic locations. Well, stories about King Arthur's times will always be popular with every age group, Charlotte. So will pretty girls with pretty complexions, pretty luxe complexions like yours. Well, thank you. Janet Lee and Deborah Padgett will make you and Lux Toilet so proud of them in Prince Valiant. They're like me, you know. They wouldn't be without Lux. Nine out of ten stars depend on mild, gentle Lux Toilet Soap to care for their valuable complexions. Lever Brothers will return your money if you don't think Lux is every bit as wonderful as we say it is. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. The curtain rises on Act Three of A Blueprint for Murder, starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam. <laughs> Lynn agreed it would be better for Doug if he stayed with me until it was over. The boy and I moved in with Fred and Maggie Sargent. Then came the hearing. We got exactly nowhere. All the judge did was echo what the district attorney had been saying right along. The state has failed to offer any tangible proof that Mrs. Cameron put strychnine in a calcium capsule. Undeniably, Mrs. Cameron had a possible motive for such a crime, but... As the defense pointed out, she's not the only one. Mr. Whitney Cameron, her brother-in-law, also stood to inherit the fortune should both the children and Mrs. Cameron die. Mrs. Cameron is a woman of high repute. Witnesses have testified that she was an affectionate and indulgent mother to both her foster children. I find that the state has failed to establish probable cause and I hereby order the defendant discharged forthwith. Well, I guess that's that, Mr. Cameron. We're licked, unless we can find new evidence. Now, you spoke to her a few minutes ago, just before she left the courtroom. What'd she say? She asked about Doug. He's been with you all week, hasn't he? Yes, at Fred Sargent's house. Boy, know about what's been going on? No, I, I, I told him she was called out of town, Chicago. I asked her just now if I could keep the boy until tomorrow. She agreed. I said I'd bring him home in the morning. She's pretty sore at you, huh? No, that's just it. She doesn't realize I've had any part of all this. She thinks it's been entirely a police matter. It's a tough break for all of us. I can't leave that boy in her hands. I've got to get him away, and I've only got until tomorrow. Well, just... Don't you do anything foolish, Mr. Cameron. Don't you do anything you'll be sorry for. The way things stand, the boy belongs with her. She has legal custody. Legal custody so she can poison him, too? You all know she's guilty. What do you do about it? You throw up your hands and offer your sympathy. Now, look, you're all upset. That's perfectly understandable. But why don't you just... That's losing my mind, that's all. Now, you stop by tomorrow. You do that, Mr. Cameron. You bring your lawyer friend. Maybe... Maybe we can figure something out. <laughs> All that night, I tried to think of something. Fred and Maggie, too. Some legal way of getting Doug away from her. It was no use. There just wasn't time. The next morning, I brought Doug back to Lynn. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting, Cam. I took Doug upstairs to show him some presents I brought for him. He seems so glad to get home. Yes, I'm, I'm sure he is. He was telling me all about the plans you two have been making, about spending the summer together. Yes, I'm looking forward to that as much as he is. This isn't easy to tell you, Cam, but I'm afraid we'll have to postpone it. Remember I told you I was planning a trip to Europe? Well, yes, but I've I I've just thought... got to get away from all this unpleasantness. You can understand that, can't you? It's all been such a nightmare. When... When do you want to go? Well, I've been lucky. I've got reservations on the Victoria, and it's sailing tomorrow night. That soon? Mm. We'll probably be gone for about a whole year. I'm planning quite an itinerary. We'll spend two or three weeks in England and then 
France, Switzerland, and then if Doug wants to... I left the house a few moments later. There was only one thing left to do. I went first to the steamship office and then to one of those little stores that sells garden supplies. Well, if you're looking for something to kill ants, I think this ought to take care of them. Uh, what is this stuff, a liquid or a paste? It's a liquid. They put honey in it to attract the ants, and then, of course, the arsenic does the rest. But if you got any children, you better be careful where you put it. Yes, yes, I will. You know, it's a funny thing. We got lots of insecticides today that don't hurt humans. But people keep on asking for these old standbys. You certainly seem to carry a variety. What are these things, these white pills? <laughs> Innocent looking, aren't they? They look like aspirin. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Every one of these pills is stamped with a W. There, you see? That identifies them. But what are they? Strongest stuff we ever carry. Rodenticide. Kills rats and gophers. Put out by a Midwestern concern. Arsenic? Strychnine. Enough to kill a horse. Well, good luck with the ants, mister. Come back again. When the Victoria sailed the following night, I was aboard. Doug was delighted to see me. Lynn seemed rather pleased herself after the first shock of surprise. Later, when Doug went to bed, she met me in the cocktail. I think this is wonderful, Cam. But now, really, this isn't just a sudden impulse to take a boat ride. Doug, believe me, he didn't doubt me for a moment. I'm older and wiser. Well, it's really quite simple. My firm had me down for a trip to France. And I thought you said Venezuela. I felt that now was as good a time as any to make it. All right. And now the real reason. Well, standing by while you went through all this horrible ordeal was as miserable for me as it was for you. I wanted you to know that. You're making this trip just to tell me that? It isn't one of those things you can say in one night while someone's packing trunks. Not if you want to sound convincing. Oh, I see. Still don't believe me, huh? You're a hard woman. And when did you decide to come along? When you first told me you were going to Europe. Why then? Because that was the moment when I realized how much I'd miss you. I wish I could believe that. No... No, I take it back. I want to believe you, Cam. And I do. I do. My plan couldn't have been working more smoothly. It could have been a wonderful trip if only the circumstances had been different. There were moments when I was horrified by the enormity of what I was going to do. And those terrible moments of doubt when I wonder if Lynn weren't innocent. But at the bottom of everything was the overwhelming fact that Polly had been murdered. It was our last night at sea. My time had finally run out. Where's Lynn, Uncle Cam? She's waiting for me out on deck, Doug. I told her I wanted to come down and say goodnight to you. There's a big dance in the ballroom, huh? It won't be long now before you'll be getting all dressed up and going to dances, too. You want to bet? I hate dancing. Uncle Kim, can't you stay with us in England? Oh, I'd like to, Doug, but, well, you know, I've got to earn a living, you know. Well, then when will I see you again? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll get a chance to fly over during the summer. You promise? Okay, I promise. Oh, you'll have a wonderful time in Europe. I would if you were alone. Now, don't you worry about that. Right now, I want you to go to sleep. Okay. I'll see you in the morning before we dock. Good night, Uncle Kim. Have a good time tonight. Thanks. Good night, boy. I went to my stateroom and put it in my pocket. That small bottle that I'd filled with poison I'd bought the day before the boat had sailed. I met Lynn. I suggested a cocktail in the lounge before we went to the dance. I'd rehearsed this scene a hundred times in my mind. But now my mind was numb. The idea of taking the life of a human being was like a hideous dream. Bacardi cocktails. Remember, Cam? Remember? Well, of course, you wouldn't. It was just that you and I first met at a cocktail party, and they served Bacardis. But I do remember that the party was for you and Bill, mm -hmm. just before you two got married. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd met you first. I thought you were the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Why, I can eat... Hey! 
Pete, be careful. What? Oh, no. How clumsy can oh, I get? Oh, now, don't be so upset. I've spilled a few cocktails in my time. Wait for me, will you? It won't take long to change. I'll be back in a moment. The waiter brought another drink and went back to the bar. I put my hand on the little bottle in my pocket. It would be so easy, so simple. But my hand wouldn't move. It was as if it belonged to someone else. I'd have to find another opportunity later tonight. But suppose I was wrong. But Fred agreed, and Maggie, the DA, the police, all of them agreed. Only Lynn could have done it. If I could just be certain. Lynn was back now. We drank our cocktails and went to the dance. It went on and on as if it would never end. And then suddenly... Oh, no. No what? Oh, can't you hear old Lang Syne, silly? It means the end of the dance. The end of the voyage. And it's been wonderful. Feel like walking? Hmm. How about a turn or two around the deck? I'd love to. I'd better have a wrap, though, hadn't I? Yes, you'd better. Give me a key. I'll get your coat. I knew then that I just couldn't go through with it. Out on deck, I took the bottle from my pocket and dropped it into the water. I picked up a wrap in her stateroom, and then as I was leaving, my eye caught the bright array of fancy bottles on her dressing table. Perfume, lotions. It seems crazy, but somehow I sensed an association between those bottles and the one I had thrown away. I stood there looking at them. They weren't all cosmetics. There were others, too. Neatly arranged in a little traveling kit. Medicines, things for first aid, and a bottle of aspirin. Suddenly, I was back in the store, and the clerk was talking to me. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Strongest stuff we carry. Enough to kill a horse. I opened the bottle and dumped out the pills. They were all aspirin. All except three. Three pills just a little different from any of the others. And stamped with a W. Cam, don't you think it's time to call it a night? This is the last night we'll be alone for a long time. Mm. How about a good night drink? Fine, I'd like that. Your stateroom's closer than mine. Let's go in and I'll order something for not drinking. What's the matter, Cam? Nothing, uh, nothing really. I Just the unhappy thought that it's all over. Oh, the trip. I'm sorry it's over, too. But now tell me something, and I want the truth. Why did you really take this boat? You know why? I know the reason you gave me. It's all very flattering. But it's a little difficult to believe. Why? Oh, I don't know. Of course, you are the sort of man who might do crazy, impulsive things. Like going to Europe so I could be with you for five days? Yes. Cam. Your hand, your hand shaking. What is it? It's nothing. No, nothing's wrong. You know something? This drink tastes funny. It's, it's bitter. Really? Mm. Uh, let me see. Mine seems all right. It's just my imagination, I suppose. No. No, not your imagination, Lynn. A few minutes ago, when I was in here getting your wrap... I found a bottle of aspirin over there. Oh? Three of the tablets in the bottle were different from the others. They had a W on them, Lynn. That's the trademark of a tablet containing strychnine. Cam, for heaven's sakes... Why were those pills different from the others? Because they were another brand. But I refused to go through all that again. Yet they were in the same bottle. Well, why not? I'd been taking another kind of aspirin. I had a few left over, so I put them in a new bottle to save space. Is that so unusual? Lynn, the W is the trademark of a poison. Ah, so that's the real reason you came on this trip. You were behind all those ridiculous accusations from the start. You still say they were just aspirin? Of course they are. That's good. I'm relieved. I'm very relieved. Why? because that's why your drink tastes a little peculiar. I put one of those pills in your cocktail, and you've just taken it. I don't think we have anything more to discuss. Ever. Get out, Cam. Just a moment, please. Who are you? My name's Connolly, Mrs. Cameron. I'm ship's detective. 
Mr. Cameron sent for me as a witness. You've been listening to us? Yeah. As a witness. So that's what you've been expecting. An hysterical admission that the pill contains strychnine. You never give up, do you, Cam? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. The, the tablet was harmless. Mr. Cameron, seems you've made a very unfortunate mistake. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to leave. This sort of thing's getting to be a habit with him, Mr. Connolly. Connolly, wait a minute. Look at your watch, Lynn. It's been almost five minutes since you took that drink. Right now, your life can be saved. Even another five minutes, but beyond that, you'll die. You know all about strychnine, don't you? Lynn, please, please. If it was strychnine, let me call a doctor before it's too late. But on the other hand, if the tablet was nothing more than aspirin, there wouldn't be much point in calling a doctor now, would there? And if I were to admit that it did contain strychnine, there still wouldn't be any sense in phoning for a doctor. It's a sort of even Stephen, isn't it? Death by strychnine or death by the electric chair. Take your choice. Lynn, it's five minutes past one. Every second is bringing you closer to a horrible death. Don't be a fool. Strange, isn't it? You seem to be the one who's going to pieces, not I. You know, it just occurred to me, if I should die, you're the one who'll be facing the electric chair. Or hadn't you thought of that? It must take nerve to kill someone, Cam, to sit by and watch someone die. How would you like to have a death on your conscience? My death. Uh, th this is too much for me. Now, did you or did you not give this woman strychnine? I gave her a pill marked with a W that I took from that bottle on the dressing table. Then it was absolutely harmless, Mr. Conley. You have nothing to worry about. Lynn, please, you don't have much time. Tell me, Mr. Conley, what are your impressions of this man? Would you say he had character, honor, integrity? I'm sure you would. But I'm afraid his looks are quite deceiving. Let me tell you about him. He lived in my home as a guest, as a relative, as a warm friend. But all the while he was accepting my hospitality, he was taking everything I said, every incident that occurred, and was conniving to build up a case against me. Oh, but his betrayal didn't end there. Even after the court threw out his ridiculous charges, he kept on and on. But this last attempt, this is the most contemptible of all. You must really be proud of yourself, Cam. Only nothing's happening to me. Even you ought to be convinced by now you're being an idiot, a complete idiot. You were there with me the night that Polly died. You heard her screams. You saw the horrible agony she went through. Do you think that I, that anyone who'd seen that, would take the same chance of dying in that same horrible way, do you? Well, I've been an even bigger fool than you. You took me in completely. I was even falling in love with you. All right, now. Get out. Get out or I'll call the purser. I assure you that Mr. Cameron will leave at once. This is the most outrageous thing I've ever witnessed. You realize, Cameron, I'll have to make a full report of all this. Go ahead. Make your report. I went to my stateroom. I must have been sane, blindly insane. How could I have been so wrong? Apparently, Polly's death was due to one of those impossible accidents that couldn't happen but did. A million to one shot. A mistake by a careless clerk in a drugstore. I was horror-stricken at the thought that it was only by the merest chance that I hadn't murdered her. What a mess. What a complete, miserable mess I've made of everything. I wondered if I... Cameron! Cameron, come along, hurry. You're wanted in the surgeon's office right away. Mr. Cameron, I'm Dr. Wells. Mrs. Cameron is inside. Another few moments, and it would have been too late. She phoned Dr. Wells as soon as we left. Uh, doctor, she she live? Yes, Mr. Cameron. She'll live. Lynn Cameron was convicted of murder in the first degree. Her sentence, life imprisonment. And so to the names of Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, and Lydia Trueblood, and all those other young, beautiful, but evil poison murderers was added that of Lynn Cameron. Something to remember? Perhaps. 
Doug and I, we're trying to forget. Our stars will return in a moment. Pepso Dent New Flavor. Pepso Dent New Flavor. Pepso Dent New Flavor. Wow! Pepso Dent New Flavor. And the clean mouth taste for hours. Yes, the big news is Pepsi Dent has a brand new wonderful flavor. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. Please step forward, Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire. Well, I must say you both really stepped out of character tonight to play two unusual roles. There's nothing an actress likes better than to play a part entirely different from her last one. And what was your last one, Dorothy? The part of a secretary in Three Coins in the Fountain for 20th Century Fox. It's in color and cinemascope. And Clifton Webb, Gene Peters, and I went to Italy to make it. I wonder I'm not getting anywhere in this business. All the pictures of me are made in Europe. I saw Night People, which stars Gregory Peck and Broderick Crawford. One of the most exciting fillers I ever saw. And that was filmed in Berlin. Now, why don't I get those parts? I wasn't even considered for an Academy Award this year. <laughs> what a terrible oversight. Why was that, Dad? Can't imagine, unless it's because I didn't make any pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you do. You find a fountain, and you throw in a coin and make a wish. Now, where is he going to find a fountain around here? Never mind that. Where am I going to find a coin? <laughs> I haven't been working. You'd have me in tears if I didn't know you were going into a picture tomorrow. Oh, yeah, we're making no business like show business now. Well, it isn't the money, Irving. I just missed the love scenes with those Lux girls. It's not the real thing on radio. You know. Well, I can tell you that Lux is the real thing when it comes to complexion care. Lux soap is the favorite of our loveliest stars. Including Dorothy McGuire. I wouldn't be without it, Irving. Now I hear you have a delightful show for next week. We certainly think so. It's a charming romance and one of Paramount Pictures' most delightful screen comedies. Welcome, Stranger. And we have a fascinating trio of stars. First, a brand new personality, Pat Crowley. Then, one of the most lovable character actors in Hollywood. Barry Fitzgerald, and one of the screen's most handsome comedians, Cary Grant. <laughs> it should be just great, Irving. Good night. Good, Good night. night, and all our thanks. <laughs> now here's Art Linkletter with a word for the busy housewife. When you're at the store pushing that metal cart around, have you ever noticed how many detergents there are? My gosh, you get dizzy just looking at them. So what's the poor girl to do? Try all of them? Some people do. And generally speaking, they find that a good detergent gets things clean looking and... Well, then it doesn't make any difference which one you buy. Just close your oh, eyes. Oh, wait, wait, just a minute there. Open your eyes when you buy that detergent. But when you're trying to find out if your wash is really clean, don't rely on looks alone, because your nose can tell you what your eyes can't see. Oh, you mean that things aren't really clean unless they smell clean. That's right. If things don't smell clean, they aren't as clean as they should be. And like I said, all good detergents will give you a wash that's clean looking, but surf, all-purpose surf, will do more. Surf gets things so clean they smell clean, too. So clean they smell like sunshine, and that means they're clean clear through. One wash day with Surf will prove that to you. And you won't go reaching blindly for just any detergent down at the store. You'll always reach for Surf. Now remember, no matter how tough a laundry job you've got, greasy work clothes and overalls, towels, sheets, Surf gets things really clean. So get the big money saver economy sized box of Surf, because I know you'll like it. Lever Brothers Company. Makers of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Liquid Detergent, we invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Welcome Stranger, starring Cary Grant, Barry Fitzgerald, and Pat Crowley. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Yvonne Patey as Maggie, Fred Mackay as Fred, Harry Scherer as Doug, Jonathan Hole as Dr. Stevenson, 
Barney Phillips as Captain Detective Pringle, Jack Crucian as Lieutenant Detective Cole, William Conrad as the District Attorney, Joyce McCluskey as the nurse, Herb Butterfield as the judge, and Jimmy Eagles, Charlie Seal, John Larch, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Don't forget Lever Brothers' pair and a spare plan, the smart new way to buy stockings. You get three nationally advertised, first quality Canon nylon stockings, $1.85 value for just $1.85.